Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I am your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And we're going to do a little bit of a different type of video today. Most of the time when I do a virtual legality episode, especially after the stroke doing these live, I've gone over all of the documents I want to talk about. I've covered kind of ancillary thought processes and have documents ready to link to on tabs. Today, we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to read and react to the lawsuit a little bit more off the cuff. The same with the press release that the Department of Justice put out yesterday in respect of this lawsuit against Apple. So we're going to try to be a little bit more off the cuff, a little bit more easygoing, a little bit more spontaneous. And hopefully I can react to some of the membership group chats and questions a little bit more fulsomely as we go along using that method. It also allows me to have more comments, make more videos on less of a kind of rehearsal slash research time frame, and hopefully get more information out to you even more than I was doing before. So on that basis, I want to thank Akiruki for gifting five Hoglaw memberships already. I haven't even said anything. So thank you so much for the gift, Akiruki. And I hope you don't fall asleep too early in this discussion of a major federal lawsuit, but I know it's late where you are. So thank you once again. And now let's talk about what we're here to talk about. So yesterday, I'm just online doing some things for the law firm, practicing law, doing what I do. When, if you imagine those scenes in like a 1970s movie about a newsroom or any other kind of chaos that you can imagine where bells go off and lights start ringing and things happen uh, and people are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. I start to get messages in my DMs and my emails about whether or not I'm going to cover this Apple lawsuit. And I say, Apple lawsuit, I've covered a lot in Epic versus Apple. I, I know the lawsuits that are happening with Apple. What's everybody talking about? Whereupon, I start to look online for information, and I find myself, sadly, with very little to find. So there are a lot of articles that are released in the early morning yesterday, Eastern Time, about this Apple lawsuit. And most of them read like this one from, I think it's ABC News. Apple sued by Biden administration in landmark case over iPhone monopoly. And just based on that headline, I look at it and I go, are they actually going to sue over monopoly in iPhones? We've talked about that in this space a lot, which is to say, yes, of course, Apple has a monopoly on the product they created, just like I have a monopoly on creating virtual legality episodes. That can't be what they're being sued over. And if you read a little bit further in the article, you find out that you're not going to get a lot of references to the lawsuit itself. What you're going to get is quotes from Attorney General Merrick Garland of the United States that say things like, we allege that Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Well, you would allege that they violated the law, certainly. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. And then I back up and say, wait a minute. Are you really suing that they have a monopoly in the smartphone industry? Nobody has said that in any capacity, even as we've looked at it with respect to Apple and Epic and whatnot. And if we look further in things like the the, 19, the 2020s investigation of competition in digital markets done by the House subcommittee of the judiciary, which we talked about in virtual legality, you see that when they talk about Apple, what they talk about is that Apple has significant and durable market power in the mobile operating system market. Apple's dominance in this market where it controls the iOS mobile operating system that runs on Apple mobile devices has enabled it to control all software distribution to iOS devices. That's Epic versus Apple, right? And I've talked about that. I think that's too narrow of a definition of the market in this particular instance, because you can substitute iOS with Android, with other technology uh, and functions, either through your phone or your tablet, and get to a place where you can still run the applications that are otherwise locked out in iOS. And so I don't view it as a great analog for what should be monopoly enforcement, but this is what we've seen argued in the past. And it's what the headline suggests from the ABC article, but it's not what Attorney General Merrick Garland has said. And if we look at their press release in and of itself, we see that Attorney General Merrick B. Garland delivers remarks on lawsuit against Apple for monopolizing smartphone markets. So we're going to talk a little bit about monopoly principles as part of this video and why I think this is an unusual play by the Department of Justice. And I think they did it primarily because they could tie in a lot of different concepts to this particular accusation. But I don't know that it's a winner long run. And we're going to look at that as we continue through this video and reading the lawsuit. So I have skimmed the lawsuit. I made brief comments on Twitter about it yesterday. Uh, and so I have looked at it. I know what it's about, but I have not pre-recorded or thought of 
references that I'm going to make to any specific sentence or term in that lawsuit as part of this video. Good morning. Earlier today, the Department of Justice, joined by 15 states and the District of Columbia, we'll see which the, which states they are in just a second. That's a goodly amount, but it's not obviously a majority of the 50 states in the United States. It's not one of these huge ones where they say 49 states have joined us and everybody agrees, that kind of thing. We'll take a look at which states joined in just a second. My state of Michigan is represented. For what? For violating Section 2 of the Sherman Antitrust Act, which, if you remember virtual legality, is the provision that says thou shall not monopolize. Right. And this gets confusing for people because you're allowed to have a monopoly. When we say monopolize in the law, the courts and the legislature and the regulators have all agreed that that essentially means doing untoward things to create or maintain a monopoly. And we'll see that in just a second as well. But they say for violating Section 2 of the Sherman Act, over the last two decades, Apple's been big. For over a decade, iPhone sales have made up a majority of Apple's annual revenue. Today, Apple's share of the U.S. performance smartphone market exceeds 70%, and its share of the entire U.S. smartphone market exceeds 65%. Apple charges as much as nearly $1,600 for an iPhone. Now, those are interesting numbers in and of themselves because they don't match up with, as I said, that earlier report from the House subcommittee that's only a couple of years old at this point that says, among other things, Apple is a company that does these things with their hardware in order to ensure a seamless experience for consumers, which I think is generally what we would think of as the Apple ecosystem. Apple does these various things in order to present a walled garden that is a curated experience. I think that's missed by some of these regulators or people that don't like Apple. And full disclaimer, I have an iPhone sitting right next to me on my desk, but that Apple is looking to create an experience that is streamlined for people that prefer that streamlined experience. And a lot of people don't, right? A lot of people go and look at Android, just like they look at Linux or other opportunities in the personal computer space and say, I want to have this freedom. And some people look at that particular market and say, I don't want that freedom. I want this to be curated by people that know better than me. And reasonable minds can differ as to which one is the appropriate approach. But even the House subcommittee says, Apple tightly integrates its services and software applications with its products to ensure a seamless experience for consumers. And ensure is probably too strong. To attempt to ensure is probably more accurate. But that's being generous to Apple and saying they have a reason to do this. And that is to present an Apple ecosystem that gives you everything that you need. And you don't have to really think about finding other apps on the web or otherwise getting non-curated experiences. And they say that as part of this report. And then they go on to say that uh, Apple is the leading smartphone vendor in the U.S., accounting for approximately 45% of the domestic market, with more than 100 million iPhone users nationwide. Apple's iOS is also one of two dominant mobile operating systems. Remember, this report is about the OS. The other operating system, Android, is discussed elsewhere in this report. iOS runs on more than half of U.S. smartphones and tablets. Globally, Apple accounts for less than 20% of the smartphone market, and roughly 25% of smartphones and tablets run on iOS worldwide. So, Again, if you're looking at smartphones as a global market rather than an American market, and the DOJ only has jurisdiction in America, but when we look at economics, they have to consider whether or not a market participant like Apple can control price and hurt quality in such a way that they can monopolize that market, and they have to think about all the potential customers that that market has. Then when we talk about Apple, we're looking at something that the House report says they have less than 20% of the market in the world and roughly 25% of smartphones and tablets that run iOS worldwide. So we're looking at a very interesting circumstance as it stands. And so what we'd be looking for when we look at this lawsuit is some pretty stark evidence that Apple has a monopoly power over the smartphone market in its entirety, what you're defining the smartphone market as, what it means to have performance smartphones. We saw that reference here as part of this press release and other things of that nature. Unfortunately, I can tell you we're not going to see a lot of that lawyering in the lawsuit. We're not going to see a lot of the kind of proof of complaint, and that's not required at the complaint level, but I'd still like to see it in order to understand better what it is the Department of Justice is accusing Apple of doing. As our complaint alleges, Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market, not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. And I do see some more comments here. So let me grab this from Dad Ho. Good morning from a snow crushed Michigan. Yeah, it's crazy. Great fun at March Madness already. Great subject for this video. Should be named the government's continued attempt to destroy continued creativity slash innovation. Well, thank you, Dad, for that opinion on this. We will get to whether or not this is a good idea. Certainly as part of this lawsuit, reasonable minds can differ on that. And certainly reasonable minds can differ on the value of snow. 
But as it stands right now, for the first couple days of spring, Michigan has been inundated with snow, and I'd prefer that not to be the case. I also love March Madness, and I'm looking forward to the basketball this afternoon. So thank you, Dad, so much for the Super Chat. I really appreciate it. Now, consumers should not have to pay higher prices because companies break the law. That's not a statement that anyone can argue with. We allege that Apple has employed a strategy that relies on exclusionary, anti-competitive conduct that hurts both consumers and developers. And I've highlighted developers here because we know that developers, the folks that make applications that run iOS or that are sold through the App Store or that don't want to be sold through the App Store, like those from the Epic Games side of things, have a big issue with Apple and their lockdown walled garden approach to maintenance of their ecosystem. It is important to note that that's where a lot of the crying and complaining is coming from that the government is reacting to because ultimately, developers are not the parties that the Department of Justice or the FTC or some of these various other regulators are really designed under their statutes to protect, right? It's all about consumer welfare. It's about making sure that products are as low as prices as possible with the highest qualities possible and competition is having that act through the market. Developers are kind of a part of that equation insofar as they're kind of customers of Apple, but also kind of not. It's a two-sided platform in that respect. And so... Having its inclusion here in this press release signals to me that the Department of Justice is taking on more of a competitor protection, developer protection kind of standpoint than we would ordinarily like to see in a normal antitrust enforcement mechanism. For consumers, that has meant fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and its competitors. Now, that's a high bar to prove because the smartphone market has improved in quality of hardware and pricing has remained relatively stagnant for a long period of time now. So it doesn't look to the obvious eyes of someone on the outside that Apple's presence in the market has resulted in fewer choices, higher prices, or lower quality. And so that's a, that's a tough thing to bring just on its own. For developers, that has meant being forced to play by rules that insulate Apple from competition. And force is interesting there, right? Because when we talk about the government, we talk about being sued over things, that's real force. Forced to play by the rules that insulate Apple from competition means forced to enter into the license agreements that Apple requires to sell your product on the App Store. We've seen the same kind of language used by Tim Sweeney at Epic and is interesting to me because no one is actually forced to play by the rules uh, of Apple. They're only asked to use those rules if they want to sell through the Apple ecosystem. You don't really have to like that. I don't necessarily like the app development terms that Apple has put out there. I think a lot of them are a little bit arbitrary and a lot of it, a lot of them are unclear, but it doesn't mean that you're forced to use them. And that's one of the problems that some of this language that we've seen from Epic and now from the Department of Justice kind of raises in my head. As an outline in our complaint, we allege that Apple has consolidated its monopoly power, not by making its own products better, but by making other products worse. Apple carries out its exclusionary anti-competitive conduct in two principal ways. First, Apple imposes contractual restrictions and fees that limit the features and functionality that developers can offer iPhone users. Second, Apple selectively restricts access to the points of connection between third-party apps and the iPhone's operating system, degrading the functionality of non-Apple apps and accessories. And I think more than the contract restrictions, which I think they're going to have trouble kind of proving are themselves anti-competitive, this part about essentially selectively enforcing things and making sure that Apple's products and services are treated the best within their platform is probably the more interesting legal argument. This isn't a guaranteed winner for them, but we do see that in places like the House Report, in places like Europe, that this self-preferencing concept through, through platforms is one where at least the politicians outside of the judicial class have said that's probably not something that we're okay with. You see this with Amazon. Uh, and you see this in other digital market kind of analyses. And I think it's one that reasonable minds can again differ on because the question is, should these platforms be allowed to preference their own stuff within their platform environment, right? Should Apple be allowed to preference its messaging app? Should Amazon be allowed to preference its own goods? And part of me would say, I understand why you view that as unfair and certainly third parties wouldn't love it if they try to operate in these marketplaces and the apples of the world preference their own goods and services. But another part of me wants to say, well, that seems like the kind of thing that the market should be able to suss out because if I go to Amazon or an Amazon equivalent and that platform is only ever not really responding to my search requests and only offering me Amazon goods or services that aren't very good, 
then I'm going to be less likely to use that platform in the future. And they are essentially making it more likely that I'm going to go to a competing service. So I think this is a more complicated question than some people online would have you believe, but it is not a specious argument. And one thing I would say about this entire process is that unlike the Epic Games lawsuit, nobody can hand wave away a Department of Justice lawsuit, right? So this is going to be, in all likelihood, a years long process that is going to get deep into the weeds of how Apple operates. And Apple probably isn't going to wind up with a satisfactory outcome, even if they get to the end of all this and win their case, because at that point in time, they would have been operating in limbo for years and paid lawyers just ungodly amounts of money, like numbers you don't even want to hear about is what the lawyers would make defending an antitrust lawsuit like this one. So I don't know how well I'm going to be able to keep up with it on an every change type basis, probably not as much as the Epic playlist itself. Uh, but I did want to point out that even though I'm going to have my comments and concerns about various aspects of this, this is not the kind of thing that just vanishes and goes away super easily. And the Department of Justice does raise a bit of a stronger case than Epic overall, even though I would not consider it strong on its own. Apple has also suppressed the emergence of programs like cloud streaming apps, including gaming apps, as well as super apps that could reduce user dependence on Apple's own operating system and expensive hardware. Now, super apps is not an industry term. It's one that we will see them use as essentially apps that have multi-platform functionality, things that allow you to have user logins that could be used on multiple phones or tablets uh, and that Apple doesn't want you to use because they want you to essentially be only within their ecosystem. And as any iPhone user who has ever seen a green text message, and yes, we're talking about green text messages in this Department of Justice press conference, or received a tiny grainy video can attest, Apple's anti-competitive conduct also includes making it more difficult for iPhone users to message with users of non-Apple products. And this kind of gets to the core of what we'll be seeing in the lawsuit, I think, which is that this is a thing that Apple does. They say, okay, we're going to control your texting in a certain way so that if you're interacting outside of our messaging app, things are going to look a little bit differently. They're not going to operate the same way. We're not going to allow some of those other apps to use our phone APIs and software and hardware in a way that we don't like. And whether or not that in and of itself is anti-competitive or whether controlling your ecosystem and how your apps work within that ecosystem is in fact competitive by creating an alternative to the Androids of the world. And Reasonable minds can definitely differ on that, but I would tend to side with the Apple ecosystem is an alternative to an open, uh, completely uncurated marketplace like an Android, especially one that isn't operating with kind of the Google Store and Google Play features. Uh, but we'll see how this goes in the long run. By doing so, Apple knowingly and deliberately degrades quality, privacy, and security for its users. For example, if an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user in Apple Messages, the text appears not only as a green bubble, but incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted, videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. As a result, iPhone users perceive rival smartphones as being lower quality because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse, even though Apple is the one responsible for breaking cross-platform messaging and it does so intentionally. For example, in 2013, a senior executive at Apple explained that supporting cross-platform messaging in Apple messages would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. And again, this kind of presupposes that Apple has an obligation to make it easy to move over to the Android platform. And I don't think that's the way the Sherman Act or the antitrust laws would have competition be read. In 2022, Apple's CEO was asked whether Apple would fix iPhone to Android messaging. The questioner added, not to make it personal, but I can't send my mom certain videos. Apple's CEO responded, buy your mom an iPhone. In addition to selectively controlling app distribution and creation, we allege that Apple is violating the law by conditionally restricting developers' access to the interface needed to make an app functional on the Apple operating system. For a product like a smartwatch or a digital wallet to be useful to an iPhone user, it must be able to communicate with the iPhone's operating system. But Apple creates barriers that make it extremely difficult and expensive for both users and developers to venture outside the Apple ecosystem. And we know what Apple's defense is going to be to this. We saw it in the Epic case itself, which is that privacy and security are part of the product that Apple sells. And so they'll probably lean on that as we look to how this is going to be interpreted in the court system. 
When it comes to smartwatches, Apple not only drives users to purchase an Apple Watch, which is only compatible with an iPhone, it also uses its technical and contractual controls to make it harder for someone with an iPhone to use a non-Apple smartwatch. And harder is interesting there, right? It's not impossible, it's just harder. And where is the line between something being harder and being illegal? And when it comes to digital wallets, Apple's exclusionary conduct goes a step further. Digital wallets allow users to store and use passes and credentials in a single app, including credit cards, personal identification, movie tickets, and car keys. Apple Wallet is Apple's proprietary digital wallet on the iPhone. Apple actively encourages banks, merchants, and other parties to participate in Apple Wallet, as you would, but it simultaneously exerts its monopoly power, its monopoly power over smartphones is the accusation, remember, to block these same partners from developing alternative payment products and services for iPhone users. Now, that sounds like you're saying they have monopoly over iPhones, not smartphones. So how does this argument all play together? For example, Apple has blocked third-party developers from creating competing digital wallets on the iPhone that use what is known as tap-to-pay functionality. That is the function that makes a digital wallet well a wallet. And I don't know who wrote this. I don't know exactly why this is the way they frame this. But to my mind, tap-to-pay is not what makes a wallet a wallet, right? In general, before iPhones existed or Apple wallets existed, having a wallet was just a place to store things. You didn't tap your wallet on something in order to pay for something. So that appears to be a separate function to the wallet function. And certainly other aspects of digital marketplaces have wallet concepts where you store funds or credits, and that doesn't require any kind of tap to pay or other hardware-based functionality. So that's a weird sentiment here. And you see the kind of thing that the Department of Justice is doing with these descriptions. Instead, Apple forces those who wanna use the wallet function to share personal information with Apple, even if they would prefer to share that information solely with their bank, medical provider, or other trusted third party. If you wanna use the Apple iPhone to tap on things, you have to give the information to the phone. When an iPhone user puts a credit card or debit card into Apple Wallet, Apple inserts itself in a process that could otherwise occur directly between the user and card issuer. This introduces an additional potential point of failure for the privacy and security of Apple users. Let's say that it does. How is that reflective of monopoly power in the smartphone market? And that is just one way in which Apple is willing to make the iPhone less secure and less private in order to maintain its monopoly power. So we can see here the Department of Justice is anticipating what we just mentioned before, which is that Apple is going to argue that the pro-competitive reasons for keeping the marketplace secure uh, or internalized is for security and privacy purposes. So the Department of Justice is trying to get in front of that and say, look, the things that they are doing in these respects hurt privacy and security, so they're not going to get away with that argument again, Your Honor, ultimately, right? That's that's the purpose of that kind of positioning. Now, I do think Apple would be well advised to kind of move into a curation and ease and efficiency is as important as security and privacy, because I think they are going to get dinged on some of these things uh, for that reason. But I'm not in charge of Apple's defense, so we'll have to see what they do. The Supreme Court defines monopoly power as the power to control prices or exclude competition. As set out in our complaint, Apple has that power in the smartphone market. We'll see if it does. Now, having a monopoly power does not itself violate the antitrust laws. That's important. People miss that. We talk about it all the time. Having a monopoly in America is not illegal under American law, but it does when a firm acquires or maintains monopoly power, not because it has a superior product or superior business acumen, but by engaging in exclusionary conduct. In essence, and we'll look at this in another document in just a minute, it, it's illegal for you to attack competition. It's not illegal for you to attack competitors. As set out in our complaint, Apple has maintained its power not because of its superiority, but because of its unlawful exclusionary behavior. Monopolies like Apple's threaten the free and fair markets upon which our economy is based. They stifle innovation, they hurt producers and workers, and they increase costs for consumers. And ultimately, hurt producers and workers is one of those things that is outside the purview of modern antitrust law in most instances. And this is one of those places where you can see the Department of Justice and the current administration in the United States trying to expand the usefulness of the antitrust laws. Increased costs for consumers, bad. Stifle innovation, bad. Producers and workers, not otherwise protected by the antitrust laws. If left unchallenged, Apple will only continue to strengthen its smartphone monopoly. But there's a law for that. See, they're getting... They're getting cute here. There's an app for that, of course, being the major marketing from Apple. The Justice Department will vigorously enforce antitrust law. Enforcing the law protects consumers from higher prices and fewer choices. That is the Justice Department's legal obligation. That is what the American people expect. That is what they deserve. 
I'm grateful to the attorneys and staff of the department's antitrust division for their tireless work on this case on behalf of the American people. I will now turn the podium over to the deputy attorney general. There are more remarks, but we're going to cease with just that press conference there. And then we're going to move on to talk about how the Department of Justice has historically looked at single firm conduct under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So as we look at this document, we're going to try to talk through what monopoly is in America, how the Sherman Act works before we get into that lawsuit, because I want folks to understand exactly how confusing and complicated this particular area of law is. So this is a Department of Justice document. I believe it's from 2008. So that's a few years back in the law. Uh, but it's not so far back that we can't use it to understand exactly what the precedents say about these things. Section two of the Sherman Act establishes three offenses, commonly termed monopolization, attempted monopolization, and conspiracy to monopolize. Although this report and most of the legal and economic debate focus specifically on the two forms of monopolization, monopoly acquisition and monopoly maintenance, much of this discussion applies to the attempt offense as well. At its core, Section 2 makes it illegal to acquire or maintain monopoly power through improper means. If we actually look at the law itself, it doesn't use that language of improper means, just like Sherman Act Section 1 doesn't talk about improper restraints of trade. The law, the legislature, the regulators, and the courts have, since the adoption of the Sherman Act in 1890, basically imposed that requirement because otherwise everything everywhere could be held to be a violation of the Sherman Act because every contract is a restraint of some kind and every activity that's done in the service of competition could be looked at as monopolization if we didn't otherwise define it to mean improper means. The possession of mon monopoly power in the relevant market and the willful acquisition or maintenance of that power as distinguished from growth or development as a consequence of a superior product, business acumen, or historic accident. That's the requirement to prove monopolization. Regarding the first element, it is settled law that the offense of monopolization requires the possession of monopoly power in the relevant market. Monopoly power means substantial market power that is durable rather than fleeting. Market power being the ability to raise prices profitably above those that would be charged in a competitive market. But as the second element makes clear, the possession of monopoly power will not be found unlawful unless it is accompanied by an element of anti-competitive conduct. Such conduct often is described as exclusionary or predatory conduct. We saw that in the press release, right? Those are lawyers giving those press conferences. They know exactly what language they are supposed to say in order to make their case the strongest. This element includes both conduct used to acquire the monopoly unlawfully and conduct used to maintain a monopoly unlawfully. A wide range of unilateral conduct has been challenged under Section 2, and it is often difficult to determine whether the conduct of a firm with monopoly power is anti-competitive. Attempted monopolization is monopolization that requires that anti-competitive conduct prong, a specific intent to monopolize, and a dangerous probability of achieving that monopoly power. The same principles are applied in evaluating both attempt and monopolization claims. Conduct that is legal for a monopolist is also legal for an aspiring monopolist. But conduct that is illegal for a monopolist may be legal for a firm that lacks monopoly power because certain conduct may not have anti-competitive effects unless undertaken by a firm already possessing monopoly power. So we already have to determine whether or not the firm we're talking about has a monopoly in this specific market that we're talking about. So the question of whether or not Apple has a monopoly power in the smartphone market in its entirety is an important and foundational one when we wind up looking at this lawsuit. Specific intent to monopolize does not mean an intent to compete vigorously. Rather, it entails a specific intent to destroy competition or to build a monopoly. One treatise concludes that consciousness of wrongdoing should not itself be important, except insofar as it bears on the appraisal of ambiguous conduct or limits the reach of the offense by those courts that improperly undervalue the power component of the attempt offense. But this particular report still requires that specific intent to monopolize. The statutory language of Section 2 is terse. Its framers left the statute's centerpiece, whether, what it means to monopolize, undefined, and the statutory language offers no further guidance in identifying prohibited conduct. Section 2 serves the same fundamental purpose as the other core provisions of U.S. antitrust law, promoting a market-based economy that increases economic growth and maximizes the wealth and prosperity of our society. The Supreme Court explained, the Sherman Act was designed to be a comprehensive charter of economic liberty aimed at preserving free and unfettered competition as the rule of trade. It rests on the premise that the unrestrained interaction of competitive forces will yield the best allocation of our economic resources, the lowest prices, the highest quality, and the greatest material progress. 
And you can see how even that statement is a bit of a policy preference the United States has made in 1890 to say that this is the way we want the economy to be functioning in the United States itself. And so people that are reasonable can still disagree with that as its premise. But in order to change that, they should have to change the Sherman Act itself, the laws that govern antitrust, instead of enforcing it differently. And I think that's probably where some of the friction comes from when we look at how the FTC and the Department of Justice are looking at these tech companies in 2024. Section 2 also advances its core purpose by ensuring that it does not prohibit aggressive competition. Competition is an inherently dynamic process. It works because firms strive to attract sales by innovating and otherwise seeking to please consumers, even if that means rivals will be less successful or never materialize at all. Failure in the form of lost sales, reduced profits, and even going out of business is a natural and indeed essential part of this competitive process. Remember, this is the Department of Justice report talking. Competition is a ruthless process, a firm that reduces costs and expands sales, injures rivals, sometimes fatally. While it may be tempting to try to protect competitors, such a policy would be antithetical to the free market competitive process on which we depend for prosperity and growth. Likewise, although monopoly has long been recognized as having the harmful effect of higher prices, curtailed output, lowered quality, and reduced innovation, it can also be the outcome of the very competitive striving we prize. Indeed, as courts and enforcers have in recent years come to better appreciate, the prospect of monopoly profits may be what attracts business acumen in the first place. Competition is ill-served by insisting that firms pull their competitive punches so as to avoid the degree of marketplace success that gives them monopoly power, or by demanding that winning firms, once they achieve such power, lie down and play dead. Section 2 thus aims neither to eradicate monopoly itself nor to prevent firms from exercising the monopoly power their legitimate success has generated, but rather to protect the process of competition that spurs firms to succeed. The law encourages all firms, monopolists and challengers alike, to continue striving. And that's the foundational kind of thought process that is supposed to be behind the enforcement of Sherman Act Section 2. Now, before we get to the next chapter of this particular document, let's take a look at some more chats and membership messages. Thank you so much, Ash Axiom, for gifting a whole law membership. I always love it when folks do that. Whoever gets that gifted membership, I hope you enjoy uh, the membership stuff, the emojis and everything else that we've got on the channel. Thank you so much, Ash Axiom. I really appreciate it. Rick Cormier, thank you for the super chat. Are we really spending tax money because someone does not like green text? I have a Garmin watch that works well with my iPhone. I'm not sure I like the idea in any way. I would say that that's probably too reductive of what the Department of Justice has put into their lawsuit. We're going to take a look at that. I do promise. I just wanted to get this foundational stuff in people's minds when we look at that document first and foremost. Uh, but yes, there is a whole bit about iPhone and Apple not making other smartwatches as accessible to the iPhone uh, infrastructure as they could have and whether or not that should be illegal under the law. Thomas Hogue again, thank you so much. Also, every iPhone has access to any brow browser, admittedly through a browser app, but allows customers to access many non-Apple games and application. Look at price fixing at 30%. Now that's wrong. That's going to be a part of their lawsuit, Dad, I promise. Uh, but yes, we'll talk about that as part of this discussion, certainly. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Let's talk about what everybody agreed to with respect to Section 2 as of 2008. Principles that have guided the evolution of Section 2 standards and enforcement. Today, a consensus, as reflected in both judicial decisions and the views of a broad cross-section of commentators, exists on at least seven core principles regarding Section 2, each of which is discussed in the sections that follow. First, unilateral conduct is outside the purview of Section 2 unless the actor possesses monopoly power or is likely to achieve it. So you can't get in trouble in Section 2 as a single firm, Apple Inc., unless you have monopoly power in a relevant market that we're going to talk about. Two, the mere possession or exercise of monopoly power is not an offense. The law addresses only the anti-competitive acquisition or maintenance of such power and certain related attempts. Three, acquiring or maintaining monopoly power through assaults on the competitive process harms consumers and is to be condemned. Four, mere harm to competitors without harm to the competitive process does not violate section two. Five, Competitive and exclusionary conduct can look alike. Indeed, the same conduct can have both beneficial and exclusionary effects, making it hard to distinguish conduct that should be deemed unlawful from conduct that should not. Next, because competitive and exclusionary conduct often look alike, courts and enforcers need to be concerned with both under-deterrence and over-deterrence. So we've got this situation in the law that we're already reading certain words into, and we've also got a problem with using it too much or too little 
because the behavior we want to curtail looks exactly like the behavior we want to support. As you can see, antitrust law is a mess, even for lawyers. So that doesn't change here, and it doesn't change with this lawsuit that we're about to read. Standards for applying Section 2 should take into account the costs, including error and administrative costs, associated with courts and enforcers applying those standards and the vagaries that we just discussed in individual cases and businesses applying them in their own day-to-day -day decision making. When we talk about enforcing Section 2, we need to take into account how difficult this is for businesses to comply with, how difficult it is for the lawyers at the Department of Justice or the FTC to figure out and to sue on and to discuss whether or not those resources should be used in that way or in better ways under different rules or different policies. The monopoly power requirement, because robust competition and conduct with long run anti-competitive effects may be difficult to distinguish in the single firm context, Congress has authorized scrutiny of single firms only they were, where they pose a danger of monopolization. Section two prohibits acquiring or maintaining monopoly power only through improper means. We discussed that and they have some precedent that they discuss in this report. From the seminal case against Standard Oil in 1911 through litigation resulting in the breakup of AT&T to the present day enforcement in high technology industries with, my, with the Microsoft case, present day they're being a little bit generous, that's from the late 90s, early 2000s, government enforcement of Section 2 has benefited U.S. consumers. Competition produces injuries. An enterprising firm may negatively affect rivals' profits or drive them out of business. Right. This is about protecting competition, not competitors. We talked about this with respect to the Epic case. This is where some of the things that we saw alleged in those documents were a little bit confused on that premise. Now they were trying to sell their case from a strength position, but we can still comment on that as we look at them. And distinguishing the two different types of conduct is very difficult. Although many different kinds of conduct have been found to violate Section 2, defining the contours of this element has been one of the most vexing questions in antitrust law. Aggressive competitive conduct by any firm, even one with market power, is beneficial to consumers. Courts should prize and encourage it. Aggressive exclusionary conduct is deleterious to consumers and courts should condemn it. The big problem lies in this. Competitive and exclusionary conduct look alike. The problem is not simply one that demands drawing fine lines separating different categories of conduct. Often the same conduct can both generate efficiencies and exclude competitors. Judicial experience and advances in economic thinking have demonstrated the potential pro-competitive benefits of a wide variety of practices that were once viewed with suspicion when engaged in by firms with substantial market power. Exclusive dealing, for example, may be used to encourage beneficial investment by the parties while also making it more difficult for competitors to distribute their products. When a competitor achieves or maintains monopoly power through conduct that serves no purpose other than to exclude competition, such conduct is clearly improper. I think we can all agree on that. There also are examples of conduct that is clearly legitimate, as when a firm introduces a new product that is simply better than its competitors' offerings. And you could argue that the introduction of the iPhone was an example of that. The hard cases arise when conduct enhances economic efficiency or reflects the kind of dynamic and disruptive change that is the hallmark of competition, but at the same time excludes competitors through means other than simply attracting consumers. In these situations, distingu distinguishing between vigorous competition by a firm with substantial market power and illegitimate forms of conduct is one of the most challenging puzzles for courts enforcers and antitrust practi practitioners. Indeed it is, and you can see why that's a problem for operating a business in America, right? If you have a massive marketplace success like an iPhone or like any other thing that you could create and put out there for sale, then you don't want to just be sued by the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission by vigorously competing for market share for that particular item. And I think reasonable minds can agree with the Department of Justice on what we're about to see, and they can agree with Apple on what would be a defense to what the Department of Justice is accusing them of. Standards of Section 2 liability that overdeter risk harmful uh, that overdeter risk harmful disruption to the dynamic competitive process itself. Being able to reap the gains from a monop from monopoly position attained through a hard-fought competitive battle or to maintain that position through continued competitive vigor may be crucial to motivating the firm to innovate in the first place. We want companies to be making iPhones, ultimately. Importantly, rules that are over-inclusive or unclear will sacrifice those benefits not only in markets in which enforcers or courts impose liability erroneously, but in other markets as well. Firms with substantial market power typically attempt to structure their affairs so as to avoid either Section 2 liability or even having to litigate a Section 2 case because the costs associated with antitrust litigation can be extraordinarily large, and they will be. And this continues for a little bit on what the values should be that the Department of Justice imposes on their time and resource expenditures. 
Finishing with Section 2 enforcement is crucial to the U.S. economy. It is a vexing area, however, given that competitive conduct and exclusionary conduct often look alike. Indeed, the same exact conduct can have pro-competitive and exclusionary effects. An efficient legal regime will consider the effects of false positives, false negatives, and the cost of administration in determining the standards to be applied to single firm conduct under Section 2. And the last thing I wanted to flag for you is a reference that we saw actually footnoted above, which is that the ju the justice system, the judiciary, looks at this as pretty settled at this point, underscoring the degree of consensus on many antitrust matters today. The justices of the Supreme Court have shown remarkable agreement in recent antitrust matters. The aggregate voting totals for the 12 antitrust cases decided over the past decade, so the early 2000s, show 91 votes in favor of the judgment and only 13 in dissent. Even more striking and directly relevant to this report, all three cases addressing claims under Section 2 were decided without dissent, i.e. unanimously. So this is not an area that has proven to be difficult for the courts to determine as much as it has been for the regulators and the executive branch of the United States at this point. Now, having said all that, hopefully that made a lot of sense. If you didn't understand any of that, or if you want me to elaborate on that, please do let me know. Uh, uh, let me know in the comments or questions or otherwise, uh, if you'd like a little bit more clarity. Uh, but I'm going to, I'm going to take the rug out from under you in just a second anyway. Britt, Hogue, we're doing it live. I will just write it and we will just do it live, LOL. Yeah, well, hey, you know what? I, I was going to come in here and say I didn't do any research because I just wanted to react to all these documents, but I'm just not operating that way. That's just not who I am. So I did a little bit of research. I wanted to make sure everybody had the right understanding of what we were looking at with respect to this law, and then we're going to dive into the lawsuit, I promise. So thank you, Britt. I appreciate you making fun of me. I think it's well-deserved, um, but yes. Oh, and uh, there's, there is uh, Papa Hogue again. So I think I've got everything right now in respect of messages. And then I promise you, I would pull the rug out from under you. If all that makes sense, and we just saw that the Supreme Court and the overall justice system is in agreement on how these things should operate, then when we look at what's happened to this particular report, we'll see that it was rescinded by the same Department of Justice about a year later. The report competition and monopoly single firm conduct under Section 2 of the Sherman Act raised too many hurdles to government antitrust enforcement and favored extreme caution and the development of safe harbors for certain conduct within reach of Section 2, Barney said. Withdrawing the Section 2 report is a shift in philosophy and the clearest way to let everyone know that the antitrust division will be aggressively pursuing cases where monopolists try to use their dominance in the marketplace to stifle competition and harm consumers. The division will return to tried and true case law and Supreme Court precedent in enforcing the antitrust laws. Now, the report was issued after a series of joint hearings involving more than 100 participants that the Department and the Federal Trade Commission held from June 2006 to May 2007 to explore the antitrust treatment of single firm conduct. Barney said that while there is no question that Section 2 cases present unique challenges, the report advocated hesitancy in the face of potential abuses by monopoly firms. She said that implicit in this overly cautious approach is the notion that most unilateral conduct is driven by efficiency and, then, and that monopoly markets are generally self-correcting. The recent developments in the marketplace should make it clear that we can no longer rely upon the marketplace alone to ensure that competition and consumers will be protected. Now, this happens in 2009. It's not entirely clear what is being referenced here about recent developments in the marketplace and lock-ins with respect to monopoly practices. But certainly in 2009, they rescinded that report. And what I just read to you is not the Department of Justice's current kind of policy for pursuing Section 2 claims. It was, however, a report that they agreed to. Uh, not so long ago, and I think is a good summary of how the legal field looks at antitrust law in the context of economics and how these things are to be enforced. Now, importantly, for those that don't know, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, they are regulators under the executive branch of the United States government. They do not set the law themselves. They interpret it when they decide whether or not to bring charges like they have in this Apple case, but they aren't the final arbiters of what is or isn't illegal under those laws. That will ultimately be determined by a court, and that's what's going to happen here. So I mentioned that I had seen a number of articles that didn't include the lawsuit. This was bothering me because they were just kind of copying over the press release that we had seen. And so it was with kind of great happiness that I saw uh, just a little bit afterwards that The Verge wound up putting the lawsuit directly online. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, I did want to mention, you saw me click on it just briefly there, that this is separate from another story that you might be seeing at the same time with respect to Europe's Digital Markets Act, or DMA, where Apple and Google 
are likely to be investigated for what Tim Sweeney on social media has called malicious compliance. But the DMA in Europe is a law that is designed to crack open some of the iOS ecosystem to allow others to run stores like the App Store on an iPhone or an iPad. Uh, and Apple and Google apparently have been in the business of quasi complying with the rules put forth by the European Union. And they've been accused of essentially being too far or too close to the line on some of those things. And so they're likely to be investigated by the EU. That's the Bloomberg headline that I've highlighted here. That is different. That is one that you'll see a story on with Microsoft and some other developers joining in to try to help Im to help move that investigation forward against uh, these mobile OS distributors. Uh, that is different than the lawsuit that we are about to read. So with that, as the very short 45-minute prelude to this lawsuit, let's take a look. And again, I will be mostly reacting off the cuff to these various things. I think there are some clever things that have happened in this document, but there's a lot that I find to be a little bit missing. So let's take a look. So this is the United States of America and the state of New Jersey, state of Arizona, state of California, District of Columbia, state of Connecticut, state of Maine, state of Michigan, go blue, state of Minnesota, state of New Hampshire, state of New York, state of North Dakota, state of Oklahoma, state of Oregon, state of Tennessee, state of Vermont, state of Wisconsin against Apple Inc. So let's take a look at this particular grouping. So one, we note that this is a lawsuit brought in the district of New Jersey. So that's a little bit unusual. Ordinarily, you'd expect this to come in perhaps California, where you've got the uh, you've got the unfair competition law that we saw used to great effect in the Epic case. But presumably, the Department of Justice doesn't want to bring that claim in California because it's Apple's home base. They employ a lot of people in California. And so in general, when you're bringing a lawsuit like this and it's a global company, you don't want to bring it in a jurisdiction where they're operating. But it's also not brought in New York, which has its business acumen, and it's not brought in the District of Columbia, where, of course, the Department of Justice is located. So it is an interesting choice to bring it in New Jersey. I don't think that there's anything that jumps out to me as being specifically important about New Jersey as a jurisdiction. It's not a particularly strong or weak set of laws on business or antitrust questions. So this might be something that's just related to the lawyers being more available in that area or not wanting it to be in New York for some reason, and New Jersey was close enough. I can't really speak to that with entirely. I know that a number of people ask me why it's in New Jersey. It's not obvious on its face. Apple could seek to have it moved, but they've certainly sold iPhones into New Jersey, and so it's unlikely that I think they'd have some success there. Now, let's grab this last super chat before we dive into the, to the uh, lawsuit itself. Brett, are we, oh, wait, no, nope. for some reason these just popped back in, so apologies. Let me make sure I get the right ones here. Britt says, I would never make fun of you, but I will make things fun with you. Your slow burn, let's keep balance approach is great against my sarcastic spit it out and burn everything to the ground style, LOL. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying certainly, Britt, thank you. I, I was not trying to accuse you of making fun of me. I was just having fun with the fact that I did say that we'd be jumping into the lawsuit and it's now 45 minutes later, so. Dorky Dane, everything should be more open. I just switched to iPhone and can't get full functionality for my Samsung earbuds on iPhone, so both teams are bad. Well, the Department of Justice is going to tell you that that's Apple's fault. They broke that functionality. But I do think that we are going to be able to look at this lawsuit as essentially one that would break down all walled gardens, all kind of creation of platforms with your own hardware and control of the operating system and the software that operates on that hardware. And we should keep that in mind as we look at that, because in my mind, that's a valid way of competing in a marketplace like smartphones is to say, we're going to compete on this wall garden approach. Obviously, my background in technology comes from video gaming and consoles. And so we see that be successful for folks like Nintendo that controls all access to their hardware uh, and has some success doing that. We see that with Sony. We see that a little less with Microsoft. But when we look at this issue from a gaming perspective, we should read the lawsuit and wonder how much of this would apply to the Nintendos and Sonys of the world, certainly. Thank you. All right. So we start with the top of the complaint. As we've seen in prior lawsuits, this is where you kind of get a little bit political. This is where you assume that the journalists are going to read the first couple of pages, maybe. And so you are a little bit less legal easy in your language and a little bit more press releasey. In 2010, a top Apple executive emailed Apple's then CEO about an ad for the new Kindle e-reader. 
The ad began with a woman who was using her iPhone to buy and read books on the Kindle app. She then switches to an Android smartphone and continues to read her books using the same Kindle app. The executive wrote to Jobs, one message that can't be missed is that it is easy to switch from iPhone to Android. Not fun to watch. Jobs was clear in his response. Apple would quote unquote force developers to use its payment system to lock in both developers and users on its platform. Over many years, Apple has repeatedly responded to competitive threats like this one by making it harder or more expensive for its users and developers to leave than by making it more attractive for them to stay. And that's an overall thesis. That's a good first paragraph for what you're trying to establish. It's not as good of a first paragraph from a legal perspective because it's not at all clear exactly how they're forcing developers uh, to use their system or how they are encouraging people to stay with their hardware if it isn't attractive in and of itself. And you don't expect the Department of Justice to fight Apple's fight for them, but it is the question that's raised when I read the, a paragraph like that. Is that illegal? Is that bad? Is it bad to say, hey, we don't want ads out there suggesting that you can just bounce between phones? For many years, Apple has built a dominant iPhone platform and ecosystem that has driven the company's astronomical valuation. So that's, again, a bit of language that suggests to me that what we're really upset about here is that Apple is worth so much, that they're one of the biggest companies in the world. At the same time, it has long understood that disruptive technologies and innovative apps, products, and services threaten that dominance by making users less reliant on the iPhone or making it easier to switch to a non-Apple smartphone. And again, competition in the smartphone market, to me, with a sentence like that, would look like trying to build those moats and wall gardens, especially if that's already a part of the ecosystem that you're selling. Rather than respond to competitive threats by offering lower smartphone prices to consumers or better monetization for developers, Apple would meet competitive threats by imposing a series of shape-shifting rules and restrictions in its App Store guidelines and developer agreements that would allow Apple to extract higher freeze fees, thwart innovation, offer a less secure or degraded user experience, and throttle competitive alternatives. It has de deployed this playbook across many technologies, products, and services, including super apps, text messaging, smart smartwatches, and digital wallets, among many others. Now, this is interesting in and of itself. I think the word shape-shifting jumps out at me here because I think one of the things that they are going to complain about in this lawsuit and that we've seen developers complain about in the past is not only that Apple self-preferences its own apps, but that it applies its app developer guidelines in a somewhat arbitrary manner so that you never know as a developer exactly what you're going to comply with or not comply with. And by having that sort of Damocles hanging over you, Apple is able to control its marketplace in a way that is unfair to those third-party developers. Now, is that something that actually exercises control over the smartphone market? No, not obviously, but we haven't even seen the market try to be defined yet in this document. Apple's conduct also stifles new paradigms that threaten Apple's smartphone dominance, including the cloud, which could make it easier for users to enjoy high-end functionality on a lower-priced smartphone or make users device agnostic altogether. As one Apple manager recently observed, imagine buying an expletive Android for 25 bucks at a garage sale and it works fine and you have a solid cloud computing device. Imagine how many cases that, like that there are. Simply put, Apple feared the disintermediation of its iPhone platform and undertook a course of conduct that locked in users and developers while protecting its profits. We don't exactly know exactly how they did that here, but again, this is the early stages of the lawsuit document and so they don't really have to get to that yet. Critically, Apple's anti-competitive conduct not only limits competition in the smartphone market, but also reverberates through the industries that are affected by these restrictions, including financial services, fitness, gaming, social media, news media, entertainment, and more. Unless Apple's anti-competitive and exclusionary conduct is stopped, it will likely extend and entrench its iPhone monopoly to other markets and parts of the economy. Now, that's interesting. I want to hear more about that. For example, Apple is rapidly expanding its influence and growing its power in the automotive, content creation and entertainment and financial services industries, and often by doing so in exclusionary ways that further reinforce and deepen the competitive moat around the iPhone. A competitive moat is an interesting description because you want me to read that as bad, but competitive moat suggests to me that that's something we would ordinarily allow. This case is about freeing smartphone markets from Apple's anti-competitive and exclusionary conduct and restoring competition to lower smartphone prices for consumers, reducing fees for developers, and preserving innovation for the future. The United States and the states of New Jersey, Arizona, California, Connecticut, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New York, New North Dakota, Oklahoma, Oregon, Tennessee, Vermont, Wisconsin, and the District of Columbia, acting by and through their respective attorneys general, 
bring this case to address Apple's anti-competitive and exclusionary conduct and alleviate harm to competition. Now, one of the things we talked about already is that in order to bring this claim at all under Section 2, the jurisprudence and precedence of the Supreme Court and otherwise have suggested that you have to prove that market power first and foremost. So I haven't seen that yet. Let's see what market we're even talking about here. Introduction. The Apple Computer Company, as it was then called, was founded in 1976 to make and market personal computers. From its inception, Apple had a knack for expensive high-end design and niche marketing relative to its competitors, but it struggled to compete against rivals that offered lower prices and more programs. After two decades, Apple struggled to compete against Windows personal computers, and by the late 1990s, it was on the brink of bankruptcy. Now, this is where I think the Department of Justice is a little bit clever here. We're going to see that they're going to tie in the Microsoft cases of the late 1990s and early 2000s with Apple gaining power at all and suggest by implication that, look, we used our powers under the Antitrust Act to smack down Microsoft when they were too big. And so we should be allowed to smack you down now in 2024 when we think you're too big because you benefited from that previous, previous smackdown. So you really don't have a good moral or ethical reason to fight this one. And I think that's all between the lines, but I do think it's a bit of a clever use of the Microsoft cases that don't directly apply to this Apple case. And that's because the Microsoft cases were really about tying your operating system and software to the manufacture of hardware that was outside your control. As I said in other videos in virtual reality, they followed much closer to Epic's complaints against Google uh, and the Google Play Store with respect to Fortnite. Uh, and so when we saw Epic beat Google in court on that same on that same front, it made sense with the Microsoft precedent. It doesn't really make as much sense to me for Apple, which controls the manufacturer of their product. Are companies allowed to make technological products that incorporate hardware and software? And are they allowed to control what operates on that hardware? I think the answer to that has been and should be yes, but this certainly calls that into question on the whole. Apple's fortunes changed around the time it launched the iPod in 2001. Innovative design and savvy marketing had not been enough to drive a successful business strategy. This time, the confluence of several factors made it a smash success. Apple's iTunes application allowed iPod users to organize their song library and update their iPod. A path-clearing antitrust enforcement case brought by the United States and state attorneys general against Microsoft opened the market and constrained Microsoft's ability to prohibit companies like Apple from offering iTunes on Windows PCs. Licensing agreements with the major music labels allowed Apple to offer iPod iTunes users a wide selection of music for a fee per download. The iPod experience gave Apple a recipe for the future, a high-end device, a large number of platform participants, and a digital storefront. More importantly, it gave Apple a playbook. Drive as many consumers and third-party participants to the platform as possible and offer a wide selection of content, products, and services created by those third parties to customers. This structure put Apple in the driver's seat to generate substantial revenues through device sales in the first instance, and subsequently the ancillary fees that it derives from sitting between customers on the one hand and the products and services they love on the other. Apple's experience with the iPod set the stage for Apple's most successful product yet. Note the language they use here about sitting between consumers on the one hand and products and services they love on the other. The alternate argument to this is that they figured out a way to structure a platform and build a new marketplace that didn't exist before and made it so that people could find things that they would otherwise like to buy that they couldn't find on the internet on the whole and did it in a curated ecosystem that allowed those sales to be made more rapidly. Uh, And that again is the generous view of what Apple does, but it is certainly a plausible one that reasonable minds could argue in court and I would expect them to do so. Apple's experience with the iPods at the stage for Apple's most successful product yet In 2007, very close in stage to when we saw the Department of Justice first put forward that report on Section 2 enforcement, Apple launched the iPhone, a a smartphone that offered high-end hardware and software applications called apps, built atop a mobile operating system that mimicked the functionality and ease of use of a computer. Apple initially offered only a small number of apps that it created for the iPhone, but Apple quickly realized the enormous value that a broader community of entrepreneurial innovative developers could drive to its users and the iPhone platform more broadly. So Apple invited and capitalized on the work of these third parties while maintaining control and monetizing that work for itself. The value of third parties' work served an important purpose for Apple. Indeed, as early as 2010, then-CEO Steve Jobs discussed how to further lock customers into our ecosystem and make Apple's ecosystem even more sticky. Now, stickiness isn't illegal in and of itself, and these are quotes taken by the Department of Justice to try to establish Apple as a bad actor, right? These are the bad guys. They're trying to get you trapped in their ecosystem. But for the most part, stickiness and lock-in 
is being discussed here by Steve Jobs as something that we're trying to establish by having more value in the marketplace on the iOS app uh, app store. So it's hard for me to look at this and say, this is illegal, this is something that's nefarious, but as framed by the Department of Justice here, that's what they are trying to do. Three years later, Apple executives were still strategizing uh, how to get people hooked to the ecosystem. That strategy paid off. Over more than 15 years, Apple has built and sustained the most dominant smartphone platform and ecosystem in the United States by attracting third-party developers of all kinds to create apps that users could download on their smartphones through a digital storefront called the App Store. As developers created more and better products, content, apps, and services, more people bought iPhones, which incentivized even more third parties to develop apps for the iPhone. And this is a framework that's similar to those argued for a network effect. But again, it's a successful product kind of concept. It's not easily anticipated as problematic or illegal by the Sherman Act, which of course was written in the 19th century. Today, the iPhone's ecosystem includes products, apps, content, accessories, and services that are offered by content creators, newspaper publishers, banks, advertisers, social media companies, airlines, productivity developers, retailers, and other merchants and others. And other merchants and others is probably not the language you wanted in here, but it's a long document and lawyers make mistakes too. As Apple's power grew, its leverage over third parties reinforced its tight control over how third parties innovate and monetize on and off the smartphone in ways that were anti-competitive and exclusionary. Okay, Department of Justice, tell me more. Today, Apple charges as much as $15.99 for an iPhone and earns high margins on each one, more than double those of others in the industry. When developers imagine a new product or service for iPhone customers, Apple demands up to 30% of the price of an app whose content, product, or service it did not create. And we saw the reference to the 30% cut from my father's super chat earlier in this video. And certainly that's an argument point that Tim Sweeney at Epic and other creators of apps have brought up with Apple. Of course, the alternative argument from the Apple side of things is that the market only exists because we created this iPhone. It's an iPhone market. And if you want access to that audience, then we get some amount of money for giving you that access and allowing you to use our marketplace. We saw in the Epic case that the court was unwilling to say Apple deserved no money for that. And that's one of the reasons I would argue we don't see the Department of Justice bring the obvious kind of epic following case, the one that we saw referenced in that House report that talks about a monopoly on software and the app ecosystem. In fact, I think what we see in this document are the vestiges of a case that would have been brought on those grounds that doesn't easily match up to monopoly power and exclusionary tactics within the smartphone marketplace, right? That's where most of the competition is actually happening. It's the competition that we see was defended by the court in the Epic case as sufficient to control for whatever monopoly power Apple might have at the iOS ecosystem level. So this is an unusual step the Department of Justice has taken. We haven't seen anyone argue this before, that Apple actually has a monopoly over smartphones. Uh, and I don't know that they've established that case here yet. Apple charges as much as $15.99 for an iPhone, has a 30% cut. Uh, when customers buy a coffee or pay for groceries, Apple charges a fee for every tap to pay transaction, imposing its own form of an interchange fee on banks and a significant new cost for using credit cards. Then, of course, you don't have to use that. It's essentially a convenience fee. When users run an internet search, Google gives Apple a significant cut of the advertising revenue that an iPhone user's searches generate. Apple keenly understands that when a community of developers and accessory makers is indispensable to the success of the iPhone, they also pose an existential threat to its extraordinary profits by empowering consumers to quote unquote, think different and choose perfectly functional, less expensive alternative smartphones. And again, this is the Department of Justice being cute like they did in their press release uh, using an Apple marketing statement like think different in their own lawsuit. Apple's smartphone business model at its core is one that invites as many participants, including iPhone users and third-party developers to join its platform as possible while using contractual terms to force these participants to pay substantial fees. Using contractual terms to force these participants to pay substantial fees. Now you've got iPhone users here. I am unclear as to what I have been forced to pay as a fee as an iPhone owner, other than maybe to Verizon. Uh, but that's, that's an interesting. You wanna combine the notion that developers have to pay that 30% cut to the fact that you understand that that's going to be passed along to the people that purchase apps on the store. But again, since 30% is across the board at basically all digital marketplaces, it's unclear how that's a monopoly pricing setup. And that was something that Epic ran into in their version of the lawsuit as well. 
At the same time, Apple restricts its platform participants' ability to negotiate or compete down its fees through alternative app stores, in-app payment processors, and more. And this is what I mean by vestiges, right? This sure looks like you monopolize your app store and iOS, not that you somehow monopolize the smartphone market. In order to protect that model, Apple reduces competition in the markets for performance smartphones and smartphones generally. So in order to protect their power over in-app payment processors and value of their ecosystem, Apple reduces competition in the markets for performance smartphones and smartphones generally. Now, this is going to take a little bit of doing. This is some heavy lifting, lifting the Department of Justice has to do here because as far as I can tell so far, it sounds like Apple is competing for smartphone market share, not that they are reducing competition in the smartphone market entirely. It does this by delaying, degrading, or outright blocking technologies that would increase competition in the smartphone markets by decreasing barriers to switching to another smartphone, among other things. So they built their moat they protect their phone and they don't allow for technologies that would increase competition. But as we saw in the report that has not currently being used by the Department of Justice, it's not that you can't compete by preventing others from entering into your market. It's that you can't compete by excluding specifically or hurting competition on the whole. So this is one of those areas where I think this is a kind of broadening that the, that the elimination of that report suggested back in 2009. The suppressed technologies would provide a high quality user experience on any smartphone, which would in turn require smartphones to compete on their merits. And again, there's no reason to believe that smartphones are not currently competing on their merits. So that's a trick that the Department of Justice is going to have to pay off or not. And we'll find it as a weakness in their in their document. Apple suppresses such innovation through a web of contractual restrictions that it selectively enforces through its control of app distribution and its app review process. And I, link, I think, again, the selective enforcement is probably the strongest thing we've seen so far in this document, as well as by denying access to key points of connection between apps and the iPhone's operating system, called Application Programming Interfaces, or APIs. Apple can enforce these restrictions due to its position as an intermediary between product creators, such as developers on the one hand, and users on the other, an intermediary that created the entire product we're talking about. It's not like it's a third party that just exists on the iPhone. This complaint highlights five examples of Apple using these mechanisms to suppress technologies that would have increased competition among smartphones. So let's note first the theory that the Department of Justice is going to use. Apple, through contract restrictions and by keeping its ecosystem so walled in, in garden form, has eliminated the ability to have increased competition. It's not really saying that it's decreasing competition, it's preventing future increased competition, which as and of itself, requires us to project into the future what that competition would have looked like. So that's already kind of a bit of a leap for the Department of Justice here, but we'll see if they make a good case in these bullet points to follow. Suppressing these technologies does not reflect competition on the merits. Rather, to protect its smartphone monopoly and the extraordinary profits that monopoly generates, Apple repeatedly chooses to make its products worse for consumers to prevent competition from emerging. These examples below, individually and collectively, had contributed to Apple's ability to secure, grow, and maintain its smartphone monopoly by increasing switching costs for users, which leads to higher prices and less innovation for users and developers. Apple has used one or both mechanisms to suppress the following technologies, among others. Super apps provide a user with broad functionality in a single app. Super apps can improve smartphone competition by providing a consistent user experience that can be ported across devices. Suppressing super apps harms all smartphone users, including Apple users by denying them access to high quality experiences and it harms developers by preventing them from innovating and selling products. And again, developers are not a part of the smartphone market, so it's unclear exactly how this is to be used legally. <clears throat> cloud streaming game apps provide users with a way to play computing intensive games in the cloud. Cloud streaming games and cloud streaming in general can improve smartphone competition by decreasing the importance of expensive hardware for accomplishing high compute tasks on a smartphone. Suppressing cloud streaming games harms users by denying them the ability to play high compute games, and it harms developers by preventing them from selling such games to users. And interestingly, I think this is one that I could argue right now, <coughs> excuse me, primarily because if I'm Apple, one of the things I want to avoid is that people think that my phone doesn't work very well, and cloud streaming is going to introduce lag and potential graphical issues into the gaming environment. And you don't want to necessarily 
have people playing cloud gaming and not realizing it's not native to their iPhone and then complaining about how their iPhone is operating. So to me, this is one of those areas where, yeah, I would prefer to have cloud gaming on all of my devices. I would prefer it if Apple was not blocking those kinds of things, but I think it's pretty easy to argue it as pro-competitive, trying to make our phone look better and avoid kind of easy footfall problems than just saying this is designed to keep people down and to hurt competition in the smartphone market. Messaging apps and apps that allow users to communicate with friends, family, and other contacts. Messaging apps that work equally well across all smartphones can improve competition among smartphones by allowing users to switch phones without changing the way they communicate with friends, family, and others, which is fine. But as we were just talking about with respect to green bubbles, is the Department of Justice position that you have to have exact functionality across the entire spectrum of interoperable potential devices in order to not run afoul of the Sherman Act Section 2. I can't imagine that that would be what they want for all tech companies or all companies making products in general, but it seems to be the natural implication of what they're discussing here. Apple makes third-party messaging apps on the iPhone worse, generally, and relative to Apple Messages, Apple's own messaging app, by prohibiting third-party apps from sending or receiving carrier-based messages. By doing so, Apple is knowingly and deliberately degrading quality, privacy, and security for its users and others who do not have iPhones. Apple also harms developers by artificially constraining the size of their user base. Smartwatches are an expensive accessory that typically must be paired to a smartphone. Smartwatches that can be paired with different smartphones allow users to retain their investment in a smartwatch when switching phones, thereby decreasing the literal cost associated with switching from one smartphone to another, among other things. By suppressing key functions of third-party smartwatches, including the ability to respond to notifications and messages and to maintain consistent connections with the iPhone, Apple has denied users access to high-performing smartwatches with preferred styling, better user interfaces and services, or better batteries, and it has harmed smartwatch developers by decreasing their ability to innovate and sell products. So note what they're doing here in this part of the lawsuit. We've got a claim that Apple is monopolizing the smartphone market, which I think has not been proven yet in this document or otherwise. But what they're using to defend it is that they are hurting technology growth across a number of other different markets, gaming, um, super apps, however that might be applied, things that use multiple logins, messaging, and smartwatches to suggest that they're hurting markets that are adjacent to smartphones. Probably as I'm beginning to suspect now on page nine of this 88 page document, because they don't have a great allegation to make about actual monopolization of the smartphone market itself. So it's this kind of novel argument that by not having things that go along with smartwatches work as well as they possibly could have, or not having messaging apps be as possibly interoperable as possible, and by not allowing cloud gaming, they are somehow monopolizing the smartphone market. Digital wallets are an increasingly important way that smartphones are used and are a product in which users develop a great deal of comfort and trust as they typically contain users' most sensitive information. Digital wallets that work across smartphone platforms allow users to move from one smartphone brand to another with decreased frictions, among other things. Apple has denied users access to digital wallets that would have provided a wide variety of enhanced features and denied digital wallet developers, often banks, the opportunity to provide advanced digital payment services to their own customers. And again, this is one where I think Apple's going to have all sorts of success by arguing security and privacy and saying this is, this is what we offer as a company and we can't just have third parties operating their own wallets without risking that as part of our sales process and why people would get an iPhone in the first place. By maintaining its monopoly over smartphones, a monopoly you haven't proven yet, department, Apple is able to harm consumers in a wide variety of additional ways. For example, by denying iPhone users the ability to choose their trusted banking apps as their digital wallet, Apple retains full control both over the consumer and also over the stream of income generated by forcing users to use only Apple-authorized products in the digital wallet. Again, this is part of the argument that sounds more like you were going to bring a complaint about the iOS ecosystem. You wound up bringing one about smartphones. And I'm not sure it makes any sense. Apple also prohibits the creation and use of alternative app stores curated to reflect a consumer's preferences with respect to security, privacy, or other values. These and many other features would be beneficial to consumers and empower them to make choices about what smartphone to buy and what apps and products to patronize. Uh, it is unclear to me how Apple's internal policies about how their iPhone operates uh, reduces people's ability to make choices about what smartphone to buy. In fact, I would think it enhances them. Right To the extent Apple is operating differently than Android or Samsung or wherever else you're going to get your phone, I would think that that makes the marketplace in smartphones more competitive, different business models, different opportunities, different choices for consumers. In fact, if they were all homogenous and operated in the same open system way, I think 
consumer choice is reduced. But again, I'm just one person on these things. So we'll see how this plays out in the long term. Allowing consumers to make that choice is an obstacle to Apple's ability to maintain its monopoly. Of course, this is not the story Apple presents to the world. For decades, Apple branded itself a nimble, innovative upstart. In 1998, Apple co-founder Steve Jobs criticized Microsoft's monopoly and dirty tactics in operating systems to target Apple, which prompted the company to go to the Department of Justice in hopes of getting Microsoft to play fair. But even at that time, Apple did not face the same type of restrictions it imposes on third parties today. Apple users could use their iPod with a Windows computer, and Microsoft did not charge Apple a 30% fee for each song downloaded from Apple's iTunes store. Similarly, when Apple bought the iPhone to market in 2007, it benefited from competition among component makers and wireless carriers. So again, you see the Department of Justice in this middle section, not from a legal perspective, but kind of from a political or just rhetorical perspective is arguing that Apple is in poor position to argue the effectiveness of this lawsuit because it was them that went and complained about Microsoft back in the late 1990s. So let's grab this chat from David Hollinger. How is it that devs aren't a part of the smartphone market? If we have to build for Apple to compete, then whatever Apple does directly affects our ability to compete or not. Devs aren't in the smartphone market because they're not making smartphones. The smartphone market is, in specific, the sales and distribution of smartphones, the actual devices that you use to call people and play apps, right? Devs are a part of it in the broad scheme that we talk about things being a part of other things. But from a legal perspective, when we're talking about who's in the smartphone market for customers, it's those people that are making and selling smartphones. Sorry, David. Tendra, thank you for being a member for so long. This is why I have an Apple phone and a PC for gaming. Mac just isn't good for most games, but I don't have a problem with peripherals between the two. I also use a personal computer using Windows and an iPhone. Uh, but, you know, that's that's my choice. That's your choice. Somebody could make a different choice. I'm okay with all of those things. But certainly, uh, if we're going to say iPhones are illegal because they have contract restrictions on how their hardware and software operate, I'm going to have a, a greater problem seeing exactly what problems they're making in the smartphone market on the whole. All right, I'll take a sip of tea. And I think Water Unleashed is making the point that I've been making reading this lawsuit, but this is all why I buy Apple, right? This is what Apple's doing here, controlling these access points is why a lot of people buy Apple. And the question is, is is this lawsuit saying that that kind of walled garden is an illegal business model, right? And if it is an illegal business model, how does that affect things like gaming consoles? Because if it's entirely illegal to just operate a walled garden, then that's going to create a whole bunch of problems and a whole co host of industries, right? It's not just gaming consoles that use software OSs that are proprietary to hardware and that control access to that hardware, right? We've got medical devices. We've got all sorts of things that wind up being in the discussion if a walled garden in and of itself is illegal. So I think that's part of this discussion. That's why I wanted to have it. All right. While Apple's anti-competitive conduct arguably has benefited its shareholders to the tune of over $77 billion in stock buybacks in its 2023 fiscal year alone, it is unclear exactly why bu stock buybacks, which is just uh, buying stock from the market for itself, is a problem here. But you can see the Department of Justice has an issue with the size of Apple and the cash that it's made on the whole, whether or not it can tie that to monopoly profits or otherwise. It comes at a great cost to, co to consumers. Some of those costs are immediate and obvious, and they directly affect Apple's own customers. Apple inflates the price for buying and using iPhones while preventing the development of features like alternative app stores, innovative super apps, cloud streaming games, and secure texting. Other costs of Apple's anti-competitive conduct may be less obvious in the immediate term, but they are no less harmful and even more widespread, affecting all smartphone consumers. Apple's smartphone monopoly means that it is not economically viable to invest in building some apps like digital wallets because they cannot reach iPhone users. This means that innovations fueled by an interest in building the best, most user-focused product that would exist in a more competitive market never get off the ground. What's more, Apple itself has less incentive to innovate because it has insulated itself from competition. As Apple's executives openly acknowledge, quote, in looking at it with hindsight, I think going forward, we need to set a stake in the ground for what features we think are good enough for the consumer. I would argue that we're already doing more than what would have been good enough, but we would find it very hard to regress our product features year over year. End quote. Existing features would have been good enough today if we hadn't introduced them already, and anything new and especially expensive needs to be rigorously challenged before it's allowed into the consumer phone. Thus, it is not surprising that Apple spent more than twice as much on stock buybacks and dividends as it did on research and development. 
And again, I don't think it's unusual for a company to say, we don't need to over deliver on what people are willing to buy, especially when the market won't support it. In fact, I think you can read these quotes to suggest that Apple doesn't have control over the pricing of its phone because otherwise there wouldn't be anything that is too expensive to make because you can charge whatever you want for your phone. And instead what we see in this monopolized smartphone environment is a place like Best Buy, which I just chose randomly because this is where I used to buy my technology from having a lot of choices between Apple iPhone, Samsung Galaxy, Google Pixel, and more. And looking at these various prices, we see that the 512 gigabyte Samsung Galaxy is about $1,270 at Best Buy. We see that the Google Pixel Fold at 256 gigabytes is $1,299. And if we go and try to buy from Apple directly, which is usually more in my experience, you see that their current iPhone 15 Plus at a 512 gigabyte level is starting at $1,199. So you don't see any obvious kind of monopoly pricing just kind of looking at these things. And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on phone pricing or the various places that you can get these things. But certainly as I read through this, I wanted to see what is the iPhone pricing model? How do these things look in practice? And nothing looks to me like Apple is just selling their phones for whatever they want regardless. And maybe there are differences in the hardware, but you don't see the Department of Justice arguing that. Okay. Moreover, Apple has demonstrated its ability to use its smartphone monopoly to impose fee structures and manipulate app review to inhibit aggrieved parties from taking advantage of regulatory and judicial solutions imposed on Apple that attempt to narrowly remedy harm from its conduct. So it, it looks like this is a, a direct response to that European kind of action that we were looking at. And I do think that's one of the reasons you see this lawsuit brought when it was, is that regardless of whether the Department of Justice wins on this, there are notions from a political perspective that after the Epic case, after the European Union moved on the DMA and after the investigations that are likely to start there, that there might be a court somewhere or at least a political will to move antitrust law in this direction at this point in time. So I do think that like all things that the government does, it's politically motivated, doesn't make it wrong, doesn't mean it's a sure loser or anything like that. I think there's some strong cases to be made here, even if I don't think overall the lawsuit is terribly strong. But I do think that this paragraph suggests that it's part of a greater political kind of movement. That's where the winds are blowing. Apple wraps itself in a cloak of privacy, security, and consumer preferences to justify its anti-competitive conduct. Indeed, it spends billions on marketing and branding to promote the self-serving premise that only Apple can safeguard consumers' privacy and security interests. Apple selectively compromises privacy and security interests when doing so is in Apple's own financial interest, such as degrading the security of text messages offering governments and certain companies the chance to access more private and secure versions of app stores, or accepting billions of dollars each year for choosing Google as its default search engine when more private options are available. In the end, Apple deploys privacy and security justifications as an elastic shield that can stretch or contract to serve Apple's financial and business interests. And again, this is kind of the, the, the good is the enemy of the perfect here. I, I don't know that Apple can't argue that it's more secure and more private than other alternatives. Uh, but not as perfectly secure and private as it might otherwise be in some kind of platonic ideal universe and find itself illegal for that reason. But certainly you see the Department of Justice trying to get in front of what it expects to be Apple's primary pro-business competition defense, which is that maintaining its ecosystem allows it to be more secure and more private. And again, if I were Apple, I would try to see if I could move into a defense that was more streamlining and curation is what our consumers want. It's what we have sold them. Privacy and security are aspects of that, but curation and ease of use are as important aspects of that. And we don't want to not be allowed to give people this curated experience. If people don't want to th think about how, what app store they use or what security risks they're taking, that should be up to us. Oh, I did miss a few here. Nishay Jones, thank you for being a member for so long. Hogue, you're a rock star. Thanks for explaining all of this. Doing my best. It's a long lawsuit, but I wanted to have this conversation with everybody, certainly. Thank you so much for the comment. David, how is it that Dave's aren't apart? We talked about that a little bit before. I'm not hitting the stars properly, so that's why we see some of these again. David says, gaming consoles allow you to buy games from other sources that aren't themselves, though. That they do. Uh, they do. They, they allow you to buy discs, although the digital versions of the consoles don't. Uh, and so that's an, a part of this conversation as well. And certainly even being able to sell your game in physical form on something like a Nintendo Switch requires you to go through certain certification and other processes 
that could be argued as anti-competitive were the theories behind this lawsuit held to their maximum extent, right? So, I mean, that's a conversation that people have to have, absolutely. Aaron Morgan, this is interesting. We are an Android family with wider family on Apple, and we love a robust discussion about the pros and cons of both. It's a choice. I tend to agree, right? I, I have a number of people that enjoy Android, like that ease of getting whatever they want on that platform. And I have a number of people like myself that prefer the app store approach, prefer having that kind of curated experience. Um, and you can tell me I'm wrong. You can tell me I'm an idiot for having an Apple product in my home. I don't mind any of those things, uh, but it is my choice to make as a consumer, usually. David, there's no tech or security reason Apple can use for why they block secure messaging to non-Apple or cloud gaming on iPhones. Network protocols slash security standards are universal and, a and Apple can't function without them. That's fine that they don't have a tech or security reason for the messaging uh, side of things. I'm not going to be able to tell you as a security expert one way or the other. So I'm going to yield to your thoughts on that and thoughts of people that know that space better than me. But what I can say is even if Apple can't argue privacy or security for those reasons, should Apple be allowed to make that decision on their own that this app functions this way on their own hardware that they created that doesn't exist if they don't invent it, right? Uh, and that's part of the conversation here. We saw it a little bit. I skipped over most of the parts that talked about this in that Department of Justice report that we looked at at the top of this video. Uh, but one of the questions is how much do you enforce these laws if they are as ambiguous as we just talked about? Because if you're going to enforce them on these kind of narrow or novel grounds, you are going to scare businesses from getting involved in future markets on the whole, right? We want Apple overall to introduce the iPhone to the marketplace in 2007. We want that to have happened. We want them to have spent the money thinking about what that product should be. We want them to market that product. We think overall people's lives are better with a smartphone market in existence than before it existed at all. So when we look at enforcing these laws, we have to take that into account as well. Thank you, Just Because, for gifting 10 Hoglaw memberships. I really appreciate it. I'm having a great conversation with you all already, even though we're already an hour and a half in. Uh, thank you so much to the more than 350 people that are watching and hopefully more that will this, this will inform in the long run. David, thank you again for another super chat. I can buy digital game keys for PC and consoles through Humble Bundle and other third-party sites. Valve, Microsoft, Epic, Sony, Nintendo don't block this. They don't buy the purchase of that application, but they certainly have their own rules and regulations for what can operate on their systems and how th that software can use the hardware that they are operating on, right? You agree to all sorts of things with respect to not introducing, at bare minimum, viruses and other things that will take over the console uh, when you make products and applications for those devices. And I think we can all agree that those kinds of harmful things are fine for for these companies to prevent. The question becomes, when does that cross the line? Is there a line to cross or should a hardware manufacturer be allowed to control the software that's operating on that hardware? Smartphones have so revolutionized American life that it can be hard to imagine a world beyond the one that Apple, a self-interested monopolist, deems good enough. But under our system of antitrust laws, good enough is quite simply not enough. Consumers, competition, and the competitive process, not Apple alone, should decide what options consumers should have. And competition, not Apple's self-interested business strategies, should be the catalyst for innovation essential to our daily lives, not only in the smartphone market, but in closely related industries like personal entertainment, automotive infotainment, and even more innovations that have not yet been imagined. Competition is what will ensure that Apple's conduct and business decisions do not thwart the next Apple. That's what we were just talking about, right? And to here, we have a somewhat stolen base, right? First, we have good enough is quite simply not good enough. The competitive process should decide what options consumers should have. They haven't really established that Apple isn't operating in a competitive market at the smartphone level. They're just deciding what R&D expenditures they should make and what they don't need to make at the current product offering and pricing that they have, which is how we would expect internal companies to decide what to do. They're not just crazily spending money all over the place in the hopes that they will succeed in a market. You would hope not, at least. Uh, and then they, you see, you want them, they want, the Department of Justice wants to attach this notion that the smartphone market is essential to our daily lives as separate from things like console gaming, one would assume. But then because of their theory that drags in all these other kind of ancillary markets, they have to suggest that personal entertainment, automotive infotainment, 
and other innovations are also also essential to our daily lives, even if they haven't established that marketplace power as of yet. Protecting competition and the innovation that competition inevitably ushers in for consumers, developers, publishers, content creators, and device manufacturers is why plaintiffs bring this lawsuit under Section 2 of the Sherman Act to challenge Apple's maintenance of its monopoly over smartphone markets, which affects hundreds of millions of Americans every day. Plaintiffs bring this case to rid smartphone markets of Apple's monopolization and exclusionary conduct and to ensure that the next generation of innovators can upend the technological world as we know it with new and transformative technologies. It's unclear why Apple's contracts that govern the smartphone would do this, but we're really pretty early on yet. Apple is a global technology company with headquarters in Cupertino, California. As you know, if you look at the back of your iPhone, Apple is one of the world's most valuable public companies with a market capitalization over $2.5 trillion. In fiscal year 2023, Apple generated annual net revenues of $383 billion and net income of $97 billion. Apple's net income exceeds any other company in the Fortune 500 and the gross domestic products of more than 100 countries. And that's great. It's not terribly useful from a legal perspective. They're big. The iPhone Apple signature product is the primary driver of Apple's growth and profitability, routinely commanding profit margins of more than 30% on devices alone, significantly higher than its smartphone competitors. iPhone sales have made a majority of Apple's annual revenue every year since 2012. Apple increasingly extracts revenue from iPhone users beyond the initial smartphone sale. For example, Apple offers iPhone upgrades, apps and in-app payments, paid digital subscription services, accessories, and more. Apple refers to these offerings as services and wearables, home and accessories, respectively. In fiscal year 2023, these offerings accounted for nearly one third of Apple's total revenue or four times what Apple earned from selling Mac computers. Some of the largest drivers of revenue within these categories are Apple's smartwatch, the Apple Watch, and Apple's App Store, where iPhone users purchase and download apps. In recent years, services have accounted for an increasing share of Apple's revenues, while the iPhone has remained the primary gateway through which US customers access these services. Apple's US market share by revenue is over 70% in the performance smartphone market, a more expensive segment of the broader smartphone market where Apple's own executives recognize the company competes and over 65% for all smartphones. These market shares have remained remarkably durable over the last decade, which is interesting because that doesn't match up with the numbers that we saw from the House report. But let's say these numbers are right, right? Performance smartphone market, whatever that is, presumably there's a definition that Apple uses that the Department of Justice has borrowed for that particular definition, but they don't share it with us in this complaint. And Apple has 70% in that market. Now, you might say a monopolist requires 100%. That isn't the case. In fact, a monopolist doesn't even require 50%. What we are looking for is that market power, the power to essentially change your price and not have obvious substitutes that a person can jump to when you try to... Pro when you try to raise that price, that makes you a monopoly of the market we're talking about. And I think based on the pricing we could see here, which we just mentioned of the Apple iPhone and the various other phones that are out in the market, we don't see an Apple that has control of the smartphone market where they can just offer whatever they want and charge whatever they want. Uh, but maybe you look at an Apple iPhone and think that it's not anywhere near as good as an Android phone because it isn't as free on some of these contract terms and things that the Department of Justice is talking about. And so even having a comparable price is essentially a monopoly price because the phone is so much worse. But that is applying a value judgment on its own behalf that I don't think the Department of Justice actually makes the case for here. Now, with that said, let's grab some more of those super chats. David asks, you keep saying they're devices. Who owns the device? Me, Apple? Am I just leasing it or buying it? If I own a device I buy, then shouldn't I be allowed to do with it as I please? I don't think there's any problem with you doing what you want with your iPhone. The, the question is whether or not somebody can bring an app into the app store or otherwise operate through Apple's approval for someone that hasn't jailbroken or otherwise opened up their iPhone, right? I'm not saying that you can't jailbreak your phone. You absolutely can. But you shouldn't expect Apple to either back that up or allow for third parties to give you things that they don't want to have in their ecosystem under the contract terms that they have, right? The question is, is Apple's model, a walled garden, allowed in the law? I think this calls into question, this lawsuit calls into question that in its entirety. So I, th I think we're caught up uh, just about. So thank you everybody for participating in the conversation. That's what I wanted to have happen as part of this video. 
And we're going to wind up skipping some sections in a little bit, I think, here, because we are running a little bit behind. Uh, Apple's smartphone market shares understate Apple's dominance and likely growth in key demographics, including among younger American consumers. So here we see Department of Justice try to argue that that 1765, which isn't complete monopoly and which Rick just said might not have monopoly power because he looked at the pricing, et cetera, uh, isn't what we're actually concerned with. We're actually talking about younger folks. One third of all iPhone users in the United States were born after 1996, as compared to just 10% for Samsung, Apple's closest smartphone competitor. Surveys show that as many as 88% of US teenagers expect to purchase an iPhone for their next smartphone. iPhone users also tend to come from higher income households. Because smartphone users generally use a single smartphone to access related products and services, locking up key user groups allows Apple to capture greater spending on iPhone related products and services, realize higher margins per user as compared to its smartphone rivals, and exercise greater control over developers and other smartphone ecosystem participants. Certainly, the more phones Apple sells, the greater control it has over ecosystem participants. There's no question about that. The question is whether they have control over the smartphone market at its base. And you can see the DOJ is a little bit concerned that people aren't going to buy that they have a monopoly over smartphones, even at this 1765 number that they claim. So they start to say, well, look, they've got a huge majority of the folks that are young. And since we were talking about lock-in in this ecosystem, getting all those young sales is going to matter even more. So we're essentially taking out an incipient monopoly, uh, Your Honor. In fiscal year 2023, Apple spent $30 billion on research and development. By comparison, Apple spent $77 billion on stock buybacks during the same year. This is weird because what does the Department of Justice think there's an appropriate amount to spend on research and development? $30 billion seems like a lot. But they are objecting to the fact that Apple spent a bunch of its money keeping its stock price high by stock buybacks, um, but that's certainly a legal maneuver, and it's it's hard to understand exactly why that's represented here in paragraph 24. Apple was founded in 1976. During its first 25 years, the company focused in large part on producing and marketing personal computers. Although the market for personal computers expanded over the next several decades, Apple struggled to gain customer adoption for its higher priced products relative to its lower cost competitors. We, we had a Macintosh in the 80s, including IBM and Microsoft. In the late 1990s, Apple significantly restructured the company and embarked on a new strategy focused not just on selling personal computers, but also consumer devices like the iPod, which led to the development of the iPhone. You might be underselling the value of the iMac in the 90s, but that's okay. And then we get um, a bunch more of what we saw summarized up top. Apple sells the iPod, iTunes, iTunes Store against the backdrop of United States versus Microsoft. This is where I think they're at least a little bit clever here. When Apple began developing mobile consumer devices, it did so against the backdrop of United States versus Microsoft which created new opportunities for innovation in areas that would be in, become critical to the success of Apple's consumer devices and the company itself, which might be gilding the lily a bit on the Microsoft case. If you actually go look at the history of that, uh, it got appealed and consent resolution to death. Microsoft wasn't actually ordered to do much of anything in the long run as a result of that particular case, but the Department of Justice likes to use it as a cudgel in current tech cases. So you can be the judge if you go look at the background of the United States versus Microsoft as to whether it was the Department of Justice that opened up computing to everyone in the early 21st century. On May 18th, 1998, the Justice Department and the Attorney Generals of 19 states and the District of Columbia filed United States versus Microsoft. It's a similar number to this one. Microsoft took steps to undermine cross-platform technologies like QuickTime on Apple's Mac computers and Microsoft Windows PCs. In particular, Apple's then senior vice president of software engineering testified that Microsoft wrote steps into its operating system to ensure that a QuickTime file will not operate reliably on Windows. It also tricked the user into believing that QuickTime technology is part of the problem actually caused by the Windows operating system and introduced greater technological incompatibilities between QuickTime and Microsoft products. In April 2000, the trial court ultimately found that Microsoft's conduct violated Section 2 of the Sherman Act. An appeals court upheld the district court's findings of liability regarding middleware, and this is a little bit of a sleight of hand here because it ultimately did not uphold the overall case. In January 2001, Apple introduced iTunes software built on Apple's QuickTime architecture and advertised it as jukebox software for organizing and listening to music. The initial versions of iTunes were only compatible with Macs. Later that same year, Apple debuted the iPod, a portable digital audio player that worked alongside iTunes to let you put your entire music collection in your pocket and listen to it wherever you go. Like iTunes, the initial iPod was only compatible with Macs. On November 1st, 2002, the trial court accepted a proposed consent decree in United States versus Microsoft. Among other things, the consent decree prohibited Microsoft from retaliating against companies for de developing or distributing products such as browsers and media players, right? Netscape. 
The consent decree also required Microsoft to make various APIs available to third-party developers, including Apple. Now, the big difference in the Microsoft case, as we mentioned above, is that Microsoft was not making the computers. It was entering into contract restrictions with computer manufacturers that were utilizing Windows. And that's one of the reasons they got in so much trouble with the antitrust department. It's also one of the reasons why Epic won their case against Google with respect to the way they were operating their app store. But here we have a different fact pattern. We have a different set of facts where Apple is making the entire product that they are controlling and others are essentially trying to break into it. Following the consent decree in October 2003, Apple launched a cross-platform version of iTunes that was compatible with the Windows operating system. As a result, a much larger group of users could finally use the iPod and iTunes, including the iTunes Store. The iTunes Store allowed users to buy and download music and play it on their iTunes computer application or on the iPod. Now note that Microsoft case doesn't really impact anything that we're looking at today with respect to the Apple lawsuit. There's just some nice lawyering in connecting the notions of that late 90s, early 2000s kind of period and what the Department of Justice did against Microsoft, how it benefited Apple and trying to undercut some of the rhetoric that Apple might use to fight against this lawsuit now. The ubiquity of iPod and iTunes on Windows, in part because of a successful antitrust enforcement action against Microsoft, contributed to the development and success of Apple's next flagship product, the iPhone. But after launching the iPhone, Apple began stifling the development of cross-platform technologies on the iPhone, just as Microsoft tried to stifle cross-platform technologies on Windows, which again is an operating system being sold to other hardware. In January 2007, Apple debuted the first generation iPhone, describing the device as an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator, and touting the fact that users could sync content from a user's iTunes library on their PC or Mac. Apple marketed the iPhone as a smartphone that was easy to use. Reflecting on the company's learning from the iPod, Apple's then CEO announced iTunes is going to sync all of your media to your iPhone, but also a ton of data, context, calendars, photos, notes, bookmarks, email accounts. The original iPhone cost approximately $299, approximately $450 in 2024 dollars adjusted for inflation with a two-year contract with the phone carrier. At launch, nearly all native apps for the iPhone were created by Apple. There were only about a dozen apps overall, including calendar, camera, clock, contacts, iPad messages, notes, phone, photos, Safari, stocks, voice memos, and weather. Within a year of launching the iPhone, Apple invited third-party developers to create native apps for the iPhone. Apple released its first software development kit, essentially the digital tools for building native apps on Apple's operating system, to encourage and enable third-party developers to create native apps for the iPhone. Apple also offered developers ways to earn money by selling apps and later in-app pur purchases and subscriptions. By 2009, Apple was running marketing campaigns highlighting the value that third-party apps provide to iPhone users with the trademark slogan, there's an app for that. Apple's decision to invite third-party participation on its iPhone platform benefited Apple too. Yeah, that's why businesses do things. The proliferation of third-party apps generated billions of dollars in profits for Apple and an iPhone user base of more than 250 million devices in the United States. Apple's market share, over 70% of the performance smartphone market and over 65% of the broader smartphone market, likely understate its monopoly power today. And it's just left out there. Who knows why, but they say it understates it. While Apple profits from third-party developers that increase the iPhone's value to users, Apple executives understand that third-party products and services can, in their own words, be fundamentally disruptive to its smartphone monopoly. Decreasing users' dependence on Apple and the iPhone and increasing competitive pressure on Apple. Now, the Department of Justice calls this a smartphone monopoly, but I think what the Apple executives likely said is that they were disruptive to whatever the market share for the iPhone could be, right? So if you have these super apps that talk about being operable across Android and iPhone that we've mentioned, like the Kindle app, if you have other apps that essentially allow a less hardware intensive Android to compete like cloud gaming apps, then you could reduce the market share of the, of the iPhone, um, but that doesn't make it a smartphone monopoly. So what I'm seeing here so far, we're 21 pages in, right? Is that the Department of Justice is essentially assuming monopoly power within the smartphone market and then explaining how, excuse me, explaining how these various bad things that Apple is doing could enhance that monopoly power. But we've skipped the foundational the, the foundational rhetoric that requires you to establish that monopoly power over the smartphone market. So that's where I'm really stuck. Apple invited third-party investment on the iPhone and then imposed tight controls on app creation and app distribution. 
Specifically, Apple sets the condition for apps it allows on the Apple App Store through its App Store review guidelines. Under these guidelines, Apple has sole discretion to review and approve all apps and app updates. Apple selectively exercises that discretion to its own benefit, deviating from or changing its guidelines when it suits Apple's interests and allowing Apple's executives to control app reviews and decide whether to approve individual apps or updates. Apple often enforces its App Store rules arbitrarily, and it frequently uses App Store rules and restrictions to penalize and restrict developers that take advantage of technologies that threaten to disrupt, disintermediate, compete with, or erode Apple's monopoly power. And again, this is one of those paragraphs where it looks to me like you're accusing Apple of having monopoly over the iOS access, the App Store, what we saw in Epic v. Apple, right? But that's not the case the Department of Justice is bringing, so I don't know exactly what to do with this paragraph here. It's a kind of strange lawsuit document. Apple also controls app creation by deciding which APIs are available to developers when they make third-party apps. Developers cannot avoid Apple's control of app distribution and app creation by making web apps, apps created using standard programming language for web-based content. Many iPhone users do not look for or know how to find web apps, causing web apps to constitute only a small fraction of app usage. And again, many iPhone users don't look for them is not actually a defense to whether or not you can use web apps on an iPhone. Um, it's just a matter of whether or not people choose to use them on an iPhone. Now, to the extent Apple blocks those things, I think you've got a case. To the extent people just aren't looking for them, I don't think there's a case at all. Nor can developers rely on alternative app stores, even though this would benefit developers and users. For example, developers cannot offer iPhone users an app store that only offers apps curated for use by children which would provide opportunities to improve privacy, security, and child safety. Again, you see the Department of Justice trying to eat Apple's lunch before Apple gets to even serve it. By contrast, Apple allows certain enterprise and public sector customers to offer versions of app stores with more curated apps to better protect privacy and security. So Apple gets to decide which folks get to run their own app store, and they tend to let enterprises, giant corporations, have their own app store so that they can feed their employees only the apps that they want. They don't allow a child store or a Tim Sweeney Epic store um, because Apple doesn't want to have them there. Um, so will that benefit developers and users? Probably in, in, in breadth, but we certainly see in economics and other aspects of our lives that an overabundance of choice may or may not benefit uh, de developers and consumers. And certainly I would say consumers are allowed to exercise that choice in the first instance of whether or not they want a curated experience at all, right? I think folks, generally speaking, know that when they purchase an Apple iPhone, they are not getting this breadth of app stores and access that they might get on a more open ecosystem. And I personally think that that is a choice that they should be allowed to make, but it, it appears the Department of Justice does not agree. Apple's control over both app distribution and app creation gives Apple tremendous power. For example, Apple designates as private the APIs needed to send short message service or SMS text messages which is a protocol used by mobile carriers since the early 1990s to allow users to send basic text messages to other mobile phone numbers using their own mobile phone numbers. Developers have no technical means to access these private APIs, but even if they did, doing so would breach their developer agreement with Apple and therefore put the developer at risk of losing the ability to distribute apps through the App Store. For example, Apple prohibits third-party iPhone apps from sending or receiving SMS text messages, even though this functionality is available through Apple Messages. Likewise, Apple can control the functionality of third-party apps and accessories through its control of app distribution, because if an app includes functionality that Apple does not like, Apple can and does exercise its discretion to simply block the app from the App Store, which would seem to be within its authority and power and not illegal on its face. But again, we get into the question of what are we talking about here, right? What are we talking about here with respect to what monopoly control is being used, right? This again sounds like Epic versus Apple, when we look at a paragraph like this one, I don't love that Apple appears to just be disabling certain functionality for third-party access of things like messaging, and that creates the, the green bubbles and things you saw referenced in the press conference release. But what does that mean overall to power, right? And if people don't like it, isn't there an alternative to purchasing an iPhone in the smartphone marketplace that's fairly easily accessible? And you can talk about moats, you can talk about lock-in, but all of those things realistically are uh, emotional and psychological more than they are problems in the marketplace itself. If people don't want to leave the iPhone ecosystem, that isn't an issue for the law, generally speaking. Apple's dominance is such that neither app developers nor iPhone users can benefit from lower cost or higher quality means of distributing apps or purchasing and providing digital products and services. 
Instead, Apple guarantees that it continues to benefit from the contributions of third-party developers and other platform participants, while also protecting itself from the competitive th threats and pressure those participants pose to Apple's smartphone monopoly. This complaint focuses on Apple's use of its dominance to impose contracts and rules that restrict the behavior and design decisions of companies other than Apple. Smartphones are platforms. Smartform, smartphones, not smartphones, smartphones combine the functionality of a traditional mobile phone with advanced hardware and software components. This cluster of services and features results in a distinct product for customers and developers. For example, smartphones not only make phone calls, but also allow users to listen to music, send text messages, take pictures, play games, access software for work, manage their finances, and browse the internet. Is there anything they can't do? Smartphones are platforms. Platforms bring together different groups that benefit from each other's participation on the platform. A food delivery app, for example, is a multi-sided platform that brings together restaurants, couriers, and consumers. A two-sided platform, for example, may bring together service providers on the one hand and consumers on the other. The technology and economics of a smartphone platform are fundamentally different from the technology and economics of a simultaneous transaction platform, such as a credit card, because smartphone platforms compete over device features and pricing in ways that do not directly relate to app store transactions. Whereas credit card transactions reflect a single simultaneous action that requires both sides of the transaction for either side to exist, consumers value smartphone platforms for a variety of reasons separate from their ability to facilitate a simultaneous transaction. True. Consumers care about non-transactional components of the phone, such as its camera and processing speed, and they care about non-transactional components of apps, such as their features and functionality, all which would seem to go against the overall lawsuit here, but let's read on. The economics of a smartphone platform are such that the platform's value to users, and in turn to the platform operator, increase when new apps and new features are added to the platform. In order to create these economic benefits for itself and its users, Apple has opened its smartphone platform to third-party developers whose countless inventions and innovations have created enormous value. Apple has willingly offered the platform to third-party developers to capture this value, even though there is no extensive regulatory framework requiring it to do so or overseeing how it interacts with those third parties. In this way, smartphone platforms are very different from other platforms like landline telephone networks, whose value-adding features were built primarily by the platform operator and which were only open to third parties when the platform operator was required to do so by regulation. When a third-party developer for the iPhone creates a valuable new feature, consumers benefit and consumer demand goes up for Apple's products, increasing the economic value of the iPhone to Apple. This has played out hundreds of thousands of times for the iPhone, resulting in an enormously valuable smartphone platform re reflecting the combined contributions of millions of developers. And this, again, is a kind of paragraph that sounds like they're objecting to the overall business model, right? None of this on its own sounds like any problem economically. Apple made a product. Apple got others involved with that product. That made the product more valuable to consumers. Consumers are happier with the product. They buy more iPhones. More developers make more things for iPhones. There's nothing wrong with any of this description of events. But they seem to object to the fact that Apple wasn't forced into creating this like a telephone creator and that they aren't creating the value on their own, right? This notion is that Apple's a bad guy and you should think of them as a bad guy because all they did was make this phone. They didn't make these apps. And so they don't deserve the money that they're taking from their cut. In contrast, limiting the features and functionality created by third-party developers and therefore available to iPhone users makes the iPhone worse and deprives Apple of the economic value it would gain as the platform operator. It makes no economic sense for Apple to sacrifice the profits it would earn from new features and functionality unless it has some other compensating reason to do so, such as protection of its monopoly profits. And this is an interesting paragraph, right? They are only operating this way because they are a monopoly. There's no other reason for operating this way. And that's that's a strange kind of stance for the Department of Justice to take. It makes no economic sense to sacrifice the profits it would earn from new features and functionality unless it has some other compensating reason to do so. Apple's internal documents show that soon after the iPhone's introduction and notwithstanding its success, the company began to fear that disintermediation of its platform and the commoditization of the iPhone would threaten Apple's substantial profits from iPhone sales and related revenue streams. Accordingly, Apple exercised its control of app creation and app distribution in key cases to cement the iPhone and App Store as the primary gateway to apps, products, and services. Apple often claims these rules and restrictions are necessary to protect user privacy or security, but Apple's documents tell a different story. In reality, Apple imposes certain restrictions to benefit its bottom line by thwarting direct and disruptive competition for its iPhone platform fees and or for the importance of the iPhone platform itself which may well be the case. I am not a big fan of the way Apple does business. 
and the way developers have talked to me about how Apple does business with respect to the app store and the app guidelines. And so I'm open to this argument. The problem I have with it from a monopoly perspective is again that as we looked at in the earlier Department of Justice report, as the jurisprudence on Sherman Act Section 2 holds in the United States, you can't get in trouble for monopolization if you don't have market power within the market that we're talking about. And so you haven't established market power. I have trouble just granting you some of these things as we get further on into the document. Three aspects of Apple's efforts to protect and exploit its smartphone monopoly are worth noting. First, Apple exercises its control over app distribution and app creation to dictate how developers innovate for the iPhone, enforcing rules and contractual restrictions that stop or delay developers from innovating in ways that threaten Apple's power. In so doing, Apple influences the direction of innovation both on and off the iPhone. Okay. Second, Apple drives iPhone users away from products and services that compete with or threaten Apple. In doing so, Apple increases the cost and friction of switching from the iPhone to another smartphone and generates extraordinarily hot profit, extraordinary profits through subscription services like Apple's proprietary music, gaming, cloud storage, and news services, advertisements within the App Store, and accessories like headphones and smartwatches. So we have, look, Apple exercises control through contracts. Apple makes its ecosystem sticky. Third, Apple uses this, these restrictions to extract monopoly rents from third parties in a variety of ways, including app fees and revenue or share requirements. For most of the last 15 years, Apple collected a tax in the form of a 30% commission on the price of any app downloaded from the App Store, a 30% tax on in-app purchases and fees to access the tools needed to develop iPhone native apps in the first place. While Apple has reduced the tax it collects from a subset of developers, Apple still extracts 30% from many app makers. Apple also generates substantial and increasing revenue by charging developers to help users find their apps in the App Store, something that for years Apple told developers was part of the reason they paid a 30% tax in the first place. For example, Apple will sell keyword searches for an app to someone other than the owner of the app. Apple is able to command these rents from companies of all sizes, including some of the largest and most sophisticated companies in the world. As Apple exercises control of app distribution and app creation, Apple slowed its own iPhone innovation and extracted more revenue and profit from its existing customers through subscriptions, advertising, and cloud services. These services increased the cost of switching from the iPhone to another smartphone because many of these services, including the proprietary ones, are exclusive to the Apple ecosystem. We provide you with good services and that increases the cost of switching because you can't get our good services on another uh, ecosystem. Okay, that sounds like competition to me, but I don't, I don't love some of this stuff. Moreover, Apple's conduct demonstrates that Apple recognized the importance of digital products and services for the success of the iPhone, while at the same time, it restricted the development and growth of non-iPhone products and services, especially those that might make it easier for users to switch from the iPhone to another smartphone. And again, if you have contract terms here that say, if you make this product for an iPhone, you're not allowed to make it for an Android, you, you've, you've got a case there potentially, but that's not exactly what the Department of Justice is arguing here. Each step in Apple's course of conduct built and reinforced the moat around its smartphone monopoly, the one you haven't established yet, the cumulative effect of this course of conduct has been to maintain and entrench Apple's smartphone monopoly at the expense of the users, developers, and other third parties who help make the iPhone what it is today. Despite major technological changes over the years, Apple's power to control app creation and distribution and extract fees from developers has remained largely the same, unconstrained by competitive pressures or market forces. That this conduct is impervious to competition reflects the success of Apple's efforts to create and maintain a smartphone monopoly, the strength of the monopoly, and the durability of Apple's power. So look at what the Department of Justice is doing here, right? I, I framed some of the stuff that we saw earlier as kind of odd. This is what they're doing. They're saying, maybe we can't prove a monopoly in the smartphone market, but we can say, look, they're not doing things that would suggest they don't have a monopoly, and they're not maximizing these various aspects of their hardware. So we can assume that a monopoly exists or essentially skipping that kind of the ghost shell of a monopoly is enough to establish that they've got this monopoly power, which remember is a requirement for establishing a violation of Sherman Act section two. Super apps. And we'll get to that in just a second uh, because there are a number of chats I wanted to grab. David Hollinger asks, what about APL, Apple intentionally trying to block my ability to jailbreak? Well, then you've got more of a case than what we've seen so far here, but certainly they're allowed to not make it easy for you to jailbreak. They're just not allowed to sue you for jailbreaking, right? So they have control over their hardware and intentionally trying to block is an open legal question. And I'm not, I'm not against the overall assertion here. I, I think people should be allowed to jailbreak and use the hardware as they see fit. And certainly companies can make that harder or easier on their own. And I don't think that Apple 
is one of those that makes it particularly easy. Uh, but that's not at the crux of what we're talking about in this lawsuit. Timur, thank you so much for the super chat. Isn't it monopoly against devs who have to pay too much and have no choice? Well, what made them be an Apple dev, right? I mean, you say devs have no choice. And what do they have a monopoly in? They have a monopoly in iOS access, right? That's what we saw Epic argue. I argued against that because of the nature of substitutes to iOS access. That's the same here, which is to say devs could, could sell into a different market. They want access to the Apple audience. They want access to that iOS operating system and that app store. And so they choose to enter into those contracts uh, and they don't have a choice for other contract terms because they want access to the iOS. That isn't in and of itself a problem, even though it puts devs in a position that they would rather not be in. It doesn't make it illegal, right? And so we're talking about illegality here. We're talking about monopolization. Uh, is it a monopoly of iOS access and control? 100%. Is that a relevant market for mo monopoly purposes? Probably not, because people can substitute out of that iOS market just as easily as anyone else. So that's the overall answer to that particular super chat. More broadly, that's not the case the Department of Justice has brought in this lawsuit. I think it's probably the one that they were thinking about bringing based on some of these paragraphs, but it's not the one they ultimately brought. David, thank you again for the copious super chats. Is it possible that digital marketplaces have found a loophole that the Sherman Act couldn't possibly have accounted for? <clears throat> is it possible that the Sherman Act is a bad tool to address multi-tiered digital platforms? Yes, absolutely, 100%. In fact, I think it is. And do I think Congress should probably look at that and potentially revise its antitrust laws and potentially write new laws to talk about how they want to handle the way digital marketplaces function? 100%, absolutely. But even in 1890, Congress wasn't really willing to put a lot of contours around the antitrust laws that they were passing at the time. And I don't know that there's a lot of political will to pass new antitrust laws that would be more specific towards these questions right now in the US. So you have regulators like the Department of Justice, like the Federal Trade Commission, using what they've got in ways that I don't think are great in respect of how these laws have been interpreted in the long run. But these regulators are trying to make legal changes through their use of lawsuits like this one. Okay, let's talk about those super apps. For years, Apple denied its users access to super apps because it viewed them as fundamentally disruptive to existing app distribution and development paradigms and ultimately Apple's monopoly power. Note that, that part's not in quotes because they almost certainly didn't say Apple's monopoly power. Apple feared super apps because it recognized that as they became popular, demand for iPhone is reduced. So Apple used its control over app distribution and app creation to effectively prohibit developers from offering super apps instead of competing on the merits. Now, the weird kind of reversal of this is, so Apple is preventing people from introducing super apps on their ecosystem. It isn't preventing anybody from making them on the Android ecosystem or Google's. So this is either a Google issue at the same time, or it's something that isn't actually affecting the iPhone on the whole, right? So Apple does these things. Apple is accused by the Department of Justice of reducing the efficacy of their own product. And yet somehow that is anti-competitive. Uh, because it's holding back the innovation of adjacent marketplaces in a way that doesn't obviously make sense on the on its face as we look through all of this. So is it illegal for Apple to say you can't make a super app on our phone? I, I wouldn't imagine it, obviously. And it's certainly the case that you're going to have to establish that they are a monopoly controller of, this, of the smartphone market at some point in order to make this lawsuit work. A super app is an app that can serve as a platform for smaller mini programs developed using programming languages such as HTML5 and JavaScript. By using programming language standard in web pages, mini programs are cross-platform, meaning they work the same on any web browser and any device. Developers can therefore write a single mini program that works whether users have an iPhone or another smartphone. Super apps can provide significant benefits to users. For example, a super app that incorporates a multitude of mini programs might allow users to easily discover and access a wide variety of content and services without signing up and logging into multiple apps. Not unlike how Netflix and Hulu allow users to find and watch thousands of movies and television shows in a single app. Almost sounds like an ad right here. As one Apple executive put it, who doesn't want faster, easier to discover apps that are do everything a full app does? Restricting super apps makes users worse off and sacrifices the short-term profitability of iPhones for Apple. Super apps are also reduced also reduce user dependence on the iPhone, including the iOS operating system and Apple's App Store. This is because a super app is a kind of middleware that can host app services and experiences without requiring developers to use the iPhone's API or code. As users interact with a super app, they rely less on the smartphone's proprietary software and more on the app itself. Eventually, users become more willing to choose a different smartphone because they can access the same interface, apps, and content they desire on any smartphone where the super app is also present. 
Moreover, developers can write mini programs that run on the super app without having to write separate apps for iPhones and other smartphones. This lowers barriers to entry for smartphone rivals, decreases Apple's control over third-party developers, and reduces switching costs. And may or may not be good in the long run because we're talking about things that are web development rather than what we might call writing to the metal in the world of video game consoles, right? When you've got third parties operating on multiple platforms, you may or may not have the same level of performance as something that is native to any individual smartphone or video game console. And I do think the Department of Justice is skipping over some of the things that could be valuable uh, to not having such third party multi-platform apps available on your system, such as performance and whether or not the data is staying in-house. You know Apple's going to argue security and privacy on this. Whether or not they argue anything else is an open question. But it is not this fait accompli the Department of Justice says it is, that things would be better off if these apps were allowed. Apple recognizes that super apps submitting programs would threaten its monopoly. As one Apple manager put it, allowing super apps to become the main gateway where people play games, book a car, make payments, would let the barbarians in at the gate. Why? Because when a super app offers popular mini programs, iOS stickiness goes down, which is fine, but it's not, again, monopoly. Stickiness is not monopoly. Lots of, in, lots of ecosystems have stickiness. Apple's fear of super apps is based on firsthand experience with enormously popular super apps in Asia. Apple does not want U.S. companies and U.S. users to benefit from similar innovations. For example, in a board of directors presentation, Apple highlighted the undifferentiated user experience on a super platform as a major headwind to growing iPhone sales in companies with popular super apps due to the low stickiness and low switching cost. For the same reasons, a super app created by a U.S. company would pose a similar threat to Apple's smartphone dominance in the United States. Apple noted as a risk in 2017 that a potential super app created by a specific U.S. company would replace usage of native OS and apps resulting in commoditization of smartphone hardware. And that's as close as you get, I think, in this section to... A, a good case from the Department of Justice, right, which is saying that we've got board of directors meetings in our research that shows that Apple was concerned about this. But again, without the fundamental proving of a monopoly power over the smartphone market, I still have an issue with all of these. Apple did not respond to the risk that super apps might disrupt its monopoly by innovating. Instead, Apple exerted its control over app distribution to stifle others' innovation. Apple created, strategically broadened, and aggressively enforced its app store guidelines to effectively block apps from hosting many programs. Apple's conduct disincentivized investments in mini program development and caused U.S. companies to abandon or limit support for the technology in the United States. In particular, part of what makes super apps valuable to consumers is that finding and using mini programs is easier than using an app store and navigating many separate apps, passwords, and setup processes. Instead of making mini program discovery easy for users, however, Apple made it nearly impossible. Since at least 2017, Apple has arbitrarily imposed exclusionary requirements that unnecessarily and unjustifiably restrict mini programs and super apps. For example, Apple required apps in the United States to, to display mini programs using a flat text-only list of mini programs. Apple also banned displaying mini programs with icons or tiles, such as descriptive pictures of the content or service offered by the mini program. Apple also banned apps from categorizing mini programs, such as by displaying recently played games or more games by the same developer. These restrictions throttle the popularity of mini programs and ultimately make the iPhone worse because it discourages developers from creating apps and other content that would be attractive to iPhone users. It makes it different. Uh, whether or not it makes it worse, I think this is probably one of the stronger areas of the Department of Justice's case. Apple also selectively enforces contractual rules with developers to prevent developers from monetizing many programs, hurting both users and developers. For example, Apple blocked many programs from accessing the APIs needed to implement Apple's in-app payment system, even if developers were willing to pay Apple's monopoly tax. Similarly, Apple blocked developers' ability to use in-app payment methods other than directly using IAP. For instance, super apps could create a virtual currency for consumers to use in many programs, but Apple blocked this too. Apple, however, allows other less threatening apps to do so. So th this is, again, a version of the Epic case, right? They want to sell V-Bucks. Fortnite is a kind of super app to some extent. It's mostly a battle royale program, but it's got other games within it. You see this kind of discussion that was had during Epic versus Apple. And here the Department of Justice kind of takes that on and says it's bad that they were throttling super apps because it would be better for their user base, but they're just substituting their judgment for Apple's. And without first showing that Apple has monopoly power in this particular market, you just have Apple making a business decision that they think is best for their market share and not one that is violative of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Not yet, at least. Similar with cloud streaming apps, Apple block cloud gaming apps that would have given users access to desirable apps and content without needing to pay for expensive Apple hardware because this would threaten its monopoly power. 
In Apple's own words, it feared it feared a world where all that matters is who has the cheapest hardware and consumers could buy an expletive Android for 25 bucks at a garage sale and have a solid computing cloud computing device. Apple's conduct made its own product worse because consumers missed out on apps and content. This conduct also cost Apple substantial revenues from third-party developers. At the same time, Apple also made other smartphones worse by stifling the growth of these cross-platform apps on other smartphones. Importantly, Apple prevented the emergence of technologies that could lower the price that consumers pay for iPhones. And this is where you see Microsoft fighting for things like the Xbox Game Cloud uh, and where you see various of the developers fighting for the DMA in the European Union. Having cloud gaming and, and things like that on iPhones is important to them. Cloud streaming apps let users run a computationally intensive program without having to process or store the program on the smartphone itself. We know that. Cloud streaming has significant benefits for users. For example, Apple has promoted the iPhone 15 by promising that its hardware is powerful enough to enable next level performance in mobile gaming. But powerful hardware is unnecessary if games are played via cloud streaming apps. I think that's going a little bit too strong on the value of cloud streaming, but maybe eventually that's the case. Native gaming is still going to be better than cloud gaming in most instances. Cloud streaming also has significant advantages for developers. For example, instead of rewriting the same game for multiple operating systems, cloud platforms can act as middleware that allows developers to create a single app that works across iOS, Android, and other operating systems. Cloud streaming provides more and simpler options for offering subscriptions, collecting payments, and distributing software updates as well. All of this helps game developers reach economies of scale and profitability they might not achieve without offering cloud gaming apps and reduces their dependence on iOS and Apple's app store. Apple wielded its power over app distribution to effectively prevent third-party developers from offering cloud gaming subscriptions. Even today, none are currently available on the iPhone. Power over app distribution, sure, but power over the smartphone market on the whole? For years, Apple imposed the onerous requirement that any cloud streaming game or any update to a cloud streaming game be submitted as a standalone app for approval by Apple. This is one of the famous ones that Microsoft complained about. Having to submit individual cloud streaming games for review by Apple increased the cost of releasing games on the iPhone and limited the number of games a developer could make available to iPhone users. For example, the highest quality games, referred to as AAA games, typically require daily or even hourly updates across different platforms. If these updates need to be individually approved by Apple, developers must either delay their software updates across all platforms or only update their games on non-iOS platforms, potentially making the iOS version of the game incompatible with other versions on other platforms until Apple approves the update. Neither option is tenable for players or developers. Until recently, Apple would have required users to download cloud streaming software separately for each individual game, install identical app updates for each game individually, and make repeated trips to Apple's App Store to find and download games. Apple's conduct made cloud streaming apps so unattractive to users that no developer designed one for the iPhone. Apple undermines cloud gaming apps in other ways too, such as by requiring cloud games to use Apple's proprietary payment system and necessitating game overhauls and payment redesigns specifically for the iPhone. Apple's rules and restrictions effectively force developers to create a specific iOS specific version of their app instead of creating a single cloud-based version that is compatible with several operating systems, including iOS. As a result, developers extend, expend considerable time and resources re-engineering apps to bring cross-platform apps like multiplayer games to the iPhone. And speaking of gaming, if you've been following the story uh, with respect to Final Fantasy XIV operating on the Microsoft ecosystem, you've seen that certain aspects of how Microsoft controls its ecosystem and access to multiplayer games and the way Square controls their access to Final Fantasy XIV has resulted in a somewhat convoluted way of buying, I think, like Square Enix coins or something along those lines, rather than a straight subscription for Final Fantasy XIV on the Microsoft ecosystem, just bringing home again that a lot of these discussions and arguments are going to be applicable to other types of hardware if we don't require someone somewhere to actually make the case that this party has monopoly control over the hardware market in question. Cloud streaming apps, broadly speaking, not just gaming, could force Apple to compete more vigorously against rivals, could. As one Apple manager recognized, cloud streaming eliminates a big reason for high performance local compute, and thus eliminates one of the iPhone's advantages over other smartphones, because then all that matters is who has the cheapest hardware. Accordingly, it reduces the need for users to buy expensive phones with advanced hardware. This problem does not stop at high-end gaming, but applies to a number of high compute requirement applications. But again, if no one else is blocking cloud gaming, and if you've just got a cheap, expletive Samsung bought from a garage sale that can run these things, that doesn't actually change things that you didn't allow cloud gaming on your Apple. It just kind of enforces the moat about how Apple operates. It's not clear at all to me how that is an anti-competitive step in the smartphone market as much as it is for developers in the iOS application market. 
So I'm just not at all clear as to how they're going to dot these I's and cross these T's. Apple undermines cross-platform messaging to reinforce obstacles to iPhone families giving their kids Android's phones. Apple could have made a better cross-platform messaging experience itself by creating iMessage for Android, but concluded that doing so will hurt us more than help us. Apple therefore continues to impede innovation in smartphone messaging, even though doing so sacrifices the profits Apple would earn from increasing the value of the iPhone to users because it helps build and maintain its monopoly power. Again, it's the kind of shadow monopoly, right? We think this would increase value. We disagree with what Apple has done. And so because they are ignoring this easy opportunity to increase the value of their phone, they must have monopoly power because a non-monopolist would take this opportunity. Messaging apps allow smartphone users to communicate with friends, family, and other contacts, and are often the primary way users interact with their smartphones. In Apple's own words, messaging apps are a central artery through which the full range of customer experience flows. They're very lofty in their board meetings at Apple, aren't they? Smartphone messaging apps operate using protocols, which are the systems that enable communication and determine the features available when users interact with each other via messaging apps. One important protocol used by messaging apps is SMS. SMS offers a broad user network but limited functionality. For example, all mobile phones can receive SMS messages, but SMS does not support modern messaging features such as large files, edited messages, or reactions like a thumbs up or a heart. Your lack of emojis is going to be an antitrust argument used against you. Many messaging apps such as WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and Signal use proprietary internet-based protocols, which are sometimes referred to as OTT protocols. OTT messaging typically involves more secure and advanced features such as encryption, typing indicators, read receipts, the ability to share rich, rich media, and disappearing or ephemeral messages. While all mobile phones can send and receive SMS messages, OTT only works between users who sign up for and communicate through the same messaging app. Indeed, I have Signal on my iPhone right now. As a result, a user cannot send an OTT message to a friend unless the friend also uses the same messaging app. Apple makes third-party messaging apps on the iPhone worse generally and relative to Apple Messages, Apple's own messaging app. By doing so, Apple is knowingly and deliberately degrading quality, privacy, and security for its users. For example, Apple designates the APIs needed to implement SMS as private, meaning third-party developers have no technical means of accessing them and are prohibited from doing so under Apple's contractual agreements with developers. As a result, third-party messaging apps cannot combine the text-to-anyone function of SMS with the advanced features of OTT messaging. Indeed, if a user wants to send somebody a message in a third-party messaging app, they must first confirm whether the person they want to talk to has the same messaging app, and if not, convince that person to download and use a new messaging app. It's not impossible. I, I swear, Department of Justice, I've got a lot of folks on Signal. By contrast, if an Apple Messenger user wants to send somebody a message, they just type their phone number into the to field and send the message because Apple Messages incorporates SMS and OTT messaging. Messaging apps benefit from significant network effects. As more people use the app, there are more people to communicate with through the app, which makes the app more valuable and in turn attracts even more users. Incorporating SMS would help third-party messaging apps grow their network and attract more users. But again, it's not Apple's job to make sure that developers have an easy time of it. And you've already established that Apple has every incentive to get value from the developers because of the money they're charging. So I'm having a little bit of difficulty following the case that you're making here, especially as monopolists in the smart market se smartphone sector. Recently, Apple has stated that it plans to incorporate more advanced features for cross-platform messaging in Apple Messages by adopting a 2019 version of the RCS protocol. Apple has not. Apple has not done so yet, and regardless, it would not cure Apple's efforts to undermine third-party messaging apps because third-party messaging apps will still be prohibited from incorporating RCS, just as they are prohibited from incorporating SMS. Moreover, the RCS standard will continue to improve over time, and if Apple does not support later versions of RCS, cross-platform messaging using RCS could soon be broken on iPhones anyway. In addition to the degrading the quality of third-party messaging apps, Apple affirmatively undermines the quality of rival smartphones. For example, if an iPhone user messages a non-iPhone user in Apple Messages, the default messaging app on an iPhone, then the text appears to the iPhone user as a green bubble and incorporates limited functionality. The conversation is not encrypted, videos are pixelated and grainy, and users cannot edit messages or see typing indicators. This signals to users that rival smartphones are lower quality, because the experience of messaging friends and family who do not own iPhones is worse, even though Apple, not the rival smartphone, is the cause of that degraded user experience. Many non-iPhone users also experience social stigma, exclusion, and blame for breaking chats where other participants own iPhones. 
This effect is particularly powerful for certain demographics, like teenagers, I would imagine, where the iPhone share is 85%, according to one survey. This social pressure reinforces switching costs and drive users to continue buying iPhones, solidifying Apple's smartphone dominance, not because Apple has made its smartphone better, but because it has made communicating with other smartphones worse. And here's the difficulty that the law has with interacting across platforms and products, right? They say iPhone has made other platforms worse, that isn't strictly true. It's the iPhone that is seeing things differently, depending on whether or not you're not using an iPhone within that messaging application. Uh, and it's a little bit hard for me to see exactly why that should be illegal, that Apple should, should be forced to make everything look the same that comes within its own application network. But it is, even if silly, another one of the stronger arguments the Department of Justice brings. I, I do like, at least, this notion of bringing in social stigma, exclusion, and blame as a reason that they Apple is doing this as solidifying Apple's smartphone dominance. Now, they don't call it a smartphone monopoly here. And again, this is one of those areas where they've called it a smartphone monopoly everywhere else. I don't think they've proven that yet, but it's odd they don't call it that here. Smartwatches we've talked about, but the basic notion here is that Apple's smartwatch is only compatible with the iPhone. So if Apple can steer a user towards buying an Apple Watch, it becomes more costly for that user to purchase a different kind of smartphone. By contrast, cross-platform smartwatches can reduce iPhone users' dependence on Apple's proprietary hardware, hardware and software. If a user purchases a third-party smartwatch that is compatible with the iPhone and other smartphones, they can switch from the iPhone to another smartphone by simply downloading the companion app on their new phone. Moreover, as users interact with a smartwatch by accessing apps from the smartwatch instead of their smartphone, users rely less on a smartphone's proprietary software and more on the smartwatch itself. Apple recognizes that driving users to purchase an Apple Watch rather than a third-party cross-platform smartwatch helps drive iPhone sales and reinforces the moat around its smartphone monopoly. Again, there's that phrase, right? For example, in a 2019 email, the vice president of product marketing for Apple Watch acknowledged that Apple Watch may help prevent iPhone customers from switching. Sure, not illegal in and of itself. Apple also recognizes that making Apple Watch compatible with Android would remove an iPhone differentiator. Apple uses its control of the iPhone, including its technical and contractual control of critical APIs, to degrade the functionality of third-party cross-platform smartwatches in at least three significant ways. First, Apple deprives iPhone users with third-party smartwatches of the ability to respond to notifications. Second, Apple inhibits third-party smartwatches from maintaining a reliable connection with the iPhone. And third, Apple undermines the performance of third-party smartwatches that connect directly with a cellular network. In doing so, Apple constrains user choice and crushes innovation that might help fill in the moat around Apple's smartphone monopoly. The ability to respond to notifications from a smartwatch is one of the top considerations for smartwatch purchasers and one of the most used product features when it is available. I don't have a smartwatch, so I don't know if this is true. A according to Apple's own market research, the ability to send and receive text messages from social and messaging apps is a critical feature for a smartwatch. In 2013, when Apple started offering users the ability to connect their iPhones with third-party smartwatches, Apple provided third-party smartwatch developers with access to various APIs related to the Apple Notification Center service, calendar contacts, and geolocation. The following year, Apple introduced the Apple Watch and began limiting third-party access to new and improved APIs for smartwatch functionality. For example, Apple prevents third-party smartwatches from accessing APIs related to more advanced actionable notifications, so iPhone users cannot respond to notifications using a third-party smartwatch. And this kind of raises the same point that we saw above with respect to arbitrary enforcement of the App Store guidelines, right? Is Apple allowed to have a watch? If they are allowed to have a watch, are they allowed to favor their watch in the way it interacts with their iPhone? I would argue that the answer to that is yes, unless they are using it improperly to maintain or advance a monopoly. Uh, and so we still have yet to get to that point in this lawsuit document where they establish how they have a monopoly power over smartphone markets. But assuming that they get there, this is the kind of thing that I think could potentially work insofar as it is anti-competitive within the smartphone market itself. A reliable Bluetooth connection is essential for a smartwatch to connect wirelessly with a smartphone and thereby function as a companion to the user's smartphone and unlock its full functionality. But Apple prohibits third-party smartwatch developers from maintaining a connection even if a user accidentally turns off Bluetooth in the iPhone's control center. Apple prohibits third-party smartwatch developers from maintaining a connection if they turn off Bluetooth. Yep. Apple gives its own Apple Watch that functionality, however, because Apple recognizes that users frequently disable Bluetooth on their iPhone without realizing that doing so disconnects their watch. As a result, iPhone users have a worse experience when they try to use a third-party smartwatch with their iPhone. 
Apple also requires users to turn on background app refresh and disable the battery saving low power mode in their iPhone settings for third party smartwatches. Uh, to remain consistently connected to their companion app, which is necessary to allow a user's iPhone and their smartwatch to update and share data about the weather or exercise tracking, even though Apple does not impose similar requirements for Apple Watch. So again, we have this kind of favoritism of their own products over alternative products. How that connects to the iPhone itself, open question. Digital wallets is going to be pretty much the same kind of discussion. Uh, today, Apple Wallet offers users a way to make these payments using their iPhone, but Apple envisions that Apple Wallet will ultimately supplant multiple functions of physical wallets to become a single app for shopping, digital keys, transit, identification, travel, entertainment, and more. As users rely on Apple Wallet for payments and beyond, it drives more sales of iPhones and increases the stickiness of the Apple ecosystem because Apple Wallet is only available on the iPhone. Thus, switching to a different smartphone requires leaving behind the familiarity of an everyday app setting up a new digital wallet and potentially losing access to certain credentials and personal data stored in the Apple wallet. That switching is not the easiest thing to do in the digital marketplace. Apple makes that a little bit harder. I think it's right for people to get potentially upset about the way they make it harder. Is that making it harder illegal? That's the open question with this lawsuit. Cross-platform digital wallets would offer an easier, more seamless, and potentially more secure way for users to switch from the iPhone to another smartphone. More secure, eh? For example, if third-party developers could create cross-platform wallets, users transitioning away from the iPhone could continue to use the same wallet with the same cards, ID, payment histories, etc., making it easier to switch smartphones. And because many users already use apps created by their preferred financial institutions, if these financial institutions offer digital wallets, then users would have access to new apps and technologies without needing to share their private financial data with additional third parties, including Apple. In the short term, these improved features would make the iPhone more attractive to users and profitable for Apple. It's unclear if that's the case. Accordingly, the absence of cross-platform digital wallets with tap-to-pay capability on the iPhone makes it harder for iPhone users to purchase a different smartphone. Again, all of these are stickiness related. I have no doubt that Apple is trying to make it as sticky as possible for you to stay in their ecosystem. The most important function for attracting users to a digital wallet for smartphones is the ability to offer tap-to-pay, the ability to make in-person payments by tapping your smartphone on a payment terminal. This is not something I do, folks. So if you do this a lot, let me know. In the chat, I, I I know that they have that little symbol for tapping your phone on things, but I have not done it myself. So it's it's just not where I'm at in my life or experience with digital infrastructure. Apple uses its control over app creation and API access to selectively prohibit developers from accessing the near field communication hardware needed to provide tap to pay through a digital wallet app. Apple Wallet is the only app on the iPhone that can use NFC to facilitate tap to pay. While Apple actively encourages banks, merchants, and other parties to participate in Apple Wallet, Apple simultaneously exerts its smartphone monopoly to block these same partners from developing better payment products and services for iPhone users. Again, you're using this in a very strange way, Department of Justice. Smartphone monopolies is monopoly in smartphones, but then you say for iPhone users, right? And the bank can presumably still make their app for non-iPhone users. Apple uses its smartphone monopoly to extract payments from banks, which need to access customers that use digital wallets on iPhones. Since Apple first launched Apple Pay long before it achieved meaningful adoption, Apple has charged issuing banks 15 basis points, <clears throat> 15%, for each credit card transaction mediated by Apple Pay. Payment apps from Samsung and Google are free to issuing banks. Apple's fees are a significant expense for issuing banks and cut into funding for features and benefits that banks might otherwise offer smartphone users, maybe. The volume of impacted transactions is large and growing. A U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau report estimates that Apple Pay facilitated nearly $200 billion in transactions in the United States in 2022. And the report goes on to explain that analysts estimate that the value of digital wallet tap to pay transactions will grow by over 150% by 2028. And I'm seeing in the chat here to this video that a number of people do use tap to pay and that I am I am not the norm on this. So that's, that's fair enough. I do think the, to the extent that Samsung and Google... Uh, or the banks that use Samsung and Google are not passing on the savings to their customers, it's no wonder why customers don't care whether or not they wind up using it on Apple or Samsung and Google, even if it costs the, the bank 0.15% more to use it on Apple. So it's it's really one of those things like the Epic Game Store that we talked about where, yeah, you can charge developers 12% instead of 30%. The developers aren't passing that on to the consumers, which we were not seeing in the way that the Epic Game Store was selling games, it's really neither here nor there from the consumer perspective on these things. And it's unclear whether or not Apple's giving up much of anything. Multiple app developers have sought direct NFC access for their payment or wallet apps. Yet Apple prohibits these developers from incorporating tap to pay functionality in their apps, 
for fear that doing so would be one way to disable Apple Pay trivially, leading to the proliferation of other payment apps that might operate cross-platform and ultimately undermine Apple's smartphone monopoly. There is no technical limitation on providing NFC access to developers seeking to offer third-party wallets. For example, Apple allows merchants to use the iPhone's NFC antenna to accept tap-to-pay payments from customers. Apple also acknowledges it is technically feasible to enable an iPhone user to set another tap, i.e. a Banks app, as a default payment app, and Apple intends to allow this functionality in Europe by regulation. Apple further impedes the adoption of digital wallets by restricting others from offering the same ability to authenticate digital payment options on online checkout pages. By limiting the ability of third-party wallets to provide a simple, fast, and comprehensive solution to online purchasing, Apple further undermines the viability of such wallets. Apple also blocks other digital wallets from serving as an alternative to Apple's in-app payment. This prevents these wallets from increasing their attractiveness and improving the overall user experience on the iPhone by offering consumer experiences that may include use of reward points in purchasing digital receipts, returns, loyalty programs, and digital coupons. Apple even prohibits developers on its app store from notifying users in the developer's app that cheaper prices for services are available using alternative digital wallets or direct payments. And they might well do that right now. That might be part of the anti-steering stuff that we see come out of the Epic case that might not be allowed too much longer. Apple's conduct reflects its knowing degradation of of the experience of its own users by blocking them from accessing wallets that would have better or different features. In so doing, Apple cements reliance on the iPhone and also imposes fees on a large and critical slice of all digital wallet NFC NFC transactions, which the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau estimates will grow to $451 billion by 2028. I don't really know exactly what to say about this other than the fact that it's, again, another aspect of the Department of Justice accusing Apple of hobbling its own iPhone and that essentially being proof of monopoly power because Apple wouldn't hobble its own iPhone if it had to compete with other phones more specifically in the smartphone marketplace, I think. Apple's moat around its, Apple's moat around its smartphone monopoly is wide and deep. It uses a similar playbook to maintain its monopoly through many other products and services. The exclusionary and anti-competitive acts described above are part of Apple's ongoing course of conduct to build and maintain its smartphone monopoly. And again, exclusionary and anti-competitive within the smartphone market would be excluding and hurting competition of smartphone competitors, not the developers, not, not watch manufacturers, not various other aspects of what we saw above. So this is kind of trying to run a lawsuit three steps removed from the ordinary way that we would see this happen. Doesn't make it a failure. Doesn't mean it won't potentially work. There are some things that Apple has done that we just saw described that I would not consider terribly consumer friendly. And some of those can be argued as anti-competitive holistically, even if it isn't the logical way that we would look at a Sherman Antitrust Act usually. Um, So here's the Department of Justice saying Apple's a very bad boy. Apple has developed a similar playbook for a much broader range of third-party apps and services as well, many of which present technologies that function as middleware, facilitate switching, reduce the need for expensive hardware, et cetera, undermine third-party location trackable devices. This is the, the tile stuff. Ultimately, the strategies that Apple has employed to date are not the only ones Apple can use to achieve its anti-competitive and lucrative ends. As technology evolves, Apple continues to evolve and shift its anti-competitive behavior to protect its monopoly power. This is interesting because one way to argue is that Apple continues to compete within the marketplace to maintain its market share, if not improve it, rather than shift its anti-competitive behavior, but reasonable minds can differ. For example, in recent years, Apple has increasingly moved into offering its own subscription services, including news, games, video, music, cloud storage, and fitness subscriptions that could be used to keep users tethered to the platform or, again, satisfy customers of the Apple ecosystem. These subscription services and other ancillary fees are a subscription part of Apple's net revenue. These subscription services can also increase switching costs among iPhone users. If an Apple user can only access their subscription service on an iPhone, they may, they may experience significant costs, time, lost content, and other frictions if they attempt to switch to a non-Apple smartphone or subscription service. And again, this sounds a lot like Apple is making its ecosystem attractive and people don't want to leave that ecosystem and that's anti-competitive, which is the part where I get a little bit, a little bit confused. These subscription services can also increase Apple's power over content creators and newspapers, among others, by exerting control over how audiences access their work, decreasing traffic to their websites and apps, and positioning Apple as the middleman or toll booth operator in the relationship between creators and users. In so doing, Apple takes on outsized importance and control in the creative economy, which may diminish incentives to fund, make, and distribute artistic expression. In addition, when one road is closed to Apple, Apple has demonstrated its ability to find new roads to the same or worse ends. For example, Apple was recently ordered to stop blocking link outs by third parties to their websites where users could buy the third party's product cheaper. 
In response, Apple reportedly allowed link outs to websites, but now charges for purchases made on the web, even if they are not an immediate result of a click from a link in the native iPhone app. And this is exactly what I said would happen from the way that that, that particular judgment in the Epic case was worded. Uh, Apple was still entitled to the funds for what they had earned from access to the, uh, the app store and the ecosystem. And so that's what Apple did. It's exactly what I said Apple would do. Uh, and certainly that's what is being fought over in Europe and malicious compliance that will be fought over again here with respect to whether or not Apple is properly complying with the anti-steering, anti-anti-steering provision order. Uh, and we'll see how that ultimately turns out. Apple is not your friend. Corporations in general are not your friend, folks. Um, but that doesn't make what they're doing illegal necessarily. Apple has also attempted to undermine cross-platform technologies like digital car keys in ways that benefit Apple but harm consumers. For example, Apple has required developers to add digital keys developed for their own apps to Apple Wallet as well. The default status of Apple Wallet steers users to the Apple Wallet rather than allowing third parties to present digital car keys only in their own cross-platform app, increasing dependence on Apple and the iPhone whenever they use their car. Apple's threatened dominance over the automotive industry goes well beyond the Apple Wallet and Apple's demands on car makers to allow innovative products and services on the iPhone. Apple's smartphone dominance extends to CarPlay, an Apple infotainment system that enables a car's central display to serve as a display for the iPhone and enables the driver to use the iPhone to control maps and entertainment in the car. Like the smartphone market, infotainment systems are increasingly considered must-have capabilities in newer vehicles. I have no vehicle that has an infotainment system, folks. I'm sorry I'm behind. Uh, it's just not what I use my car for. After leveraging its smartphone dominance to car infotainment systems, Apple has told automakers that the next generation of Apple CarPlay will take over all of the screens, sensors, and gauges in a car, forcing users to experience driving as an iPhone-centric experience if they want to use any of the features provided by CarPlay. I really can't imagine that it, they're going to take over all scenes, screens, sensors, and gauges in the car. I don't know what that would look like exactly to have an iPhone controlling your miles per hour or whatever in the car, but certainly if that is what has been told to these car manufacturers, that is Apple trying to exert its power over the smartphone industry, the iPhone base over a different industry, and that in and of itself is worth, worth discussing, but doesn't establish them as monopolists within smartphones themselves. Here too, Apple leverages its iPhone user base, again, not illegal, to exert more power over its trading partners, including American car makers, in future innovation. By applying the same playbook of restrictions to CarPlay, Apple further locks in the power of the iPhone by preventing the development or of other disintermediating technologies that interoperate with the phone but reside off device. Now, I've represented and worked with a lot of car manufacturers here in Southeast Michigan. They're always working on tech to put in their cars I don't think that Apple requiring these things necessarily means that Apple's going to get these things, nor do I think it is particularly helpful to whatever lock-in they have with respect to their iPhone. Anti-competitive effects, Apple's conduct harms the competitive process. So here we get to it a little bit. As described above, Apple protects its monopoly power in smartphones. You're going to have to establish that someday, department. And performance smartphones by using its control over app distribution and app creation to suppress or delay apps, innovations, and technologies that would reduce user switching costs or simply allow users to discover, purchase, and use their own apps and content without having to rely on Apple. So now we have a fairly clear image of what the Department of Justice is trying to do here, right? They're trying to say Apple has a monopoly in the smartphone market in the United States, uh, and they are using that monopoly power to create stickiness, friction points, and moats around the people that are already in the ecosystem and people that join the ecosystem in a way that hurts the ability of other smartphone manufacturers and participants in the smartphone market from getting their own market share, right? But we still haven't established that Apple actually has that market power over the smartphone market. So we'll see if we ever get to that. As a result, Apple faces less competition from rival smartphones and less competitive pressure from innovative cross-platform technologies, not because Apple makes its own products better, but because it makes other products worse. With the benefit of less competition, Apple extracts extraordinary profits and regulates innovation to serve its interests. This leaves all smartphone users worse off with fewer choices, higher prices and fees, lower quality smartphones, apps and accessories, and less innovation from Apple and others, as against the alternate universe where Apple doesn't do this. Left unchallenged, Apple will continue to use and strengthen its smartphone monopoly to dictate how companies can create and distribute apps in the future so that they cannot threaten Apple's smartphone monopolies. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy there, so we have to get to that monopoly power. Apple's conduct has resulted in less choice for smartphone users. Today, only two companies, Google and Samsung, remain as meaningful competitors to Apple in the premium smartphone market. 
He told us that the smartphone market only existed from 2007. So the fact that there are three competitors isn't bad overall with technology like this. We'll see how that develops in the future. Note that they call it the premium smartphone market. I don't know whether that was language that they used in an earlier draft of this document, but they have been calling it the performance smartphones uh, in, in the document overall. Even when users consider these alternatives, Apple's conduct has increased the technical, behavioral, monetary, and other costs of switching from an iPhone to an alternative smartphone. So they're sticking with the stickiness. Apple's conduct has delayed or suppressed the emergence of cross-platform technologies that would put competitive pressure on Apple's ability to extract extraordinary profits from users and developers. I think that's probably true, right? I think that the Department of Justice has made a decent case that Apple's restrictions in its app store has prevented what would have been a natural proliferation of more cross-platform technologies. The question is whether Apple is using some un, uh, untoward power within the smartphone market to accomplish that end or not. And I don't think they made their case yet. Apple's conduct has harmed users in other ways. For example, third-party digital wallets would reduce Apple's ability to charge banks high fees, 0.15%, eh? When users make payments using Apple Wallet, which ultimately costs consumers through higher prices or other reductions in quality, Alternative digital wallets could also provide smartphone users better rewards, for example, cash back, as well as a more private, secure payment experience from a user's preferred financial institution. Apple's conduct has made its own products worse, sacrificing the short-term profits Apple could earn from improving the iPhone in order to preserve the long-term value of maintaining its monopoly. In a competitive market, Apple would completely would compete aggressively to support the development of popular apps and accessories for iPhone users, which would in turn make iPhones more attractive to users and more valuable. But Apple takes steps to delay or suppress cross-platform technologies that it recognizes would be popular with users, such as super apps and cloud streaming apps, because of the threat they pose to Apple's smartphone monopoly. As a result, several developers have abandoned plans to bring super apps and cloud-based gaming apps even after making substantial investments in bringing them to market. Apple's conduct may have also slowed the development of innovative high compute apps related to education, artificial intelligence, and productivity as well. Apple has also impeded innovation by third-party smartwatches such that manufacturers have limited the functionality of their smartwatches for iPhone users, suspended support for iPhone compatibility because of Apple's restrictions, or canceled development of cross-platform smartwatches altogether. At least one company's canceled smartwatch formed part of its overall wearable strategy, including future development of virtual reality technology. Similarly, Apple degrades third-party messaging apps even though it makes cross-platform messaging less private and less secure for iPhone users because doing so raises switching costs. Apple's conduct has harmed other smartphone users as well because of the resources and risks required to maintain different features across different smartphones. Many potential super app, mini program, and other developers do not implement features prohibited by Apple, even on other smartphones. For example, prospective digital wallet providers, including US banks, have abandoned the development of digital wallet apps for either Apple or other smartphones. Another company decided not to offer users an innovative digital car key, in part because Apple required that company to add any features related to the key into Apple Wallet rather than allowing that company to put its key solely in its own app. Other developers have shrunk, shuttered, or abandoned plans to launch super apps, cloud streamed gaming apps, smartwatches, and other apps. As a result, all smartphone users enjoy lower quality smartphones, less innovation, and less choice. Apple's documents and conduct show that Apple is motivated by the anti-competitive purpose of building or maintaining monopoly power in the relevant markets. For example, Apple sacrificed substantial revenues it could have earned from super apps, mini programs, cloud streaming apps, and other third-party apps and accessories. In particular, mobile gaming already accounts for a large and growing portion of Apple's revenue. Popular cloud stream gaming apps would offer iPhone users access to popular services and in turn generate significant revenue for Apple through subscriptions and in-app purchases. Instead, Apple preferred the long-term benefit of reduced smartphone competition to the revenue it would generate from cloud gaming, super apps, and mini programs, or the quality and consumer demand increase that would flow from this innovation. Well, I actually think this is wrong, right? This is the problem that you have when you've created this as monopoly power in the smartphone market. I think the stronger argument was the one that Epic has made in the past, and that is that Apple was not allowing certain cloud gaming services, not allowing certain uh, super apps as described in this particular lawsuit, because to do so would hurt their ability to make money from the app store itself. Right, rather than the sale of the iPhone. And the iPhone is competing with Android uh, and with Samsung devices because users are getting the opportunity to choose at that level whether or not to engage in an environment like the one Apple provides or not at that level. So I, I think this is actually wrong, although I think they're doing a good job of making the case seem stronger than it is in these paragraphs. The harms to smartphone competition caused by Apple's conduct are amplified 
by Apple's decision to grant itself exclusive distribution rights to iPhone users through the Apple App Store. If Apple allowed users to access apps in other ways, users could choose an app store that did not restrict super apps or mini programs while having an iPhone, even if Apple ran its app store the same way it does today. Apple does not allow the choice, however, because if it did, developers could write their programs for any smartphone rather than specifically for iOS, just as internet browsers in Apple's QuickTime allowed developers to write programs that worked on a variety of operating systems, not just Windows. Bring back that Microsoft case, right? That would lower users' switching costs and reduce users and developers' dependence on Apple and the iPhone. Apple's smartphone monopoly gives it many levers to maintain its power, even in the face of interventions focused on eliminating or disciplining specific anti-competitive practices. This is because Apple's iPhone monopoly, secured by its anti-competitive conduct, grants it the power to set the rules by which smartphone users buy digital and hardware products and by which developers are allowed to sell those same products to users. If Apple is forced to change some of these rules, it has the power to adopt new rules, restrictions, or features that reinforce Apple's monopoly and harm competition in other ways. For example, Apple has stated plans to adopt RCS due to market and international regulatory pressure, but Apple continues to contractually restrict third parties from accessing other APIs and features that would enable cross-platform messaging apps. In another instance, Apple was enjoined from enforcing certain anti-steering provisions in its agreement with developers. In response, Apple simply created a different set of onerous restrictions on app developers to achieve a similar result. They're allowed to achieve that result. The court actually said that. In other cases, Apple has used its control over app distribution to force companies to comply with Apple's policies that may contradict local laws by delaying the review of the offending company's apps. Apple has every incentive to use its monopoly playbook in the future. So I think overall, those paragraphs, while I've identified the problems that I think are in them, are the strongest that we've seen the Department of Justice come out on these things. I still think they lack the foundation of actual monopoly power within the smartphone market. But that's the strongest kind of set of arguments that we saw was in those prior paragraphs from the Department of Justice. And I do think Apple is going to wind up having to fight this for a long, long time. Uh, Department of Justice cases, United States cases in general, take a long time to prosecute. And so I think Apple's looking at a big bill on this, even if they fight it tooth and nail. And we'll see that they have a statement that suggests they will uh, when we get towards the end of this video. Apple has every incentive to use its monopoly playbook in the future. Apple's conduct does not just impact the past and present, but poses significant risk to the development of new innovations. Apple has countless products and services, AirPods, iPads, music, Apple TV, photos, maps, iTunes, CarPlay, AirDrop, Apple Card, and Cash. These provide future avenues for Apple to engage in anti-competitive conduct. So they're establishing now for the court that not only is this what they have done, but they've also got the ability to do this with all the rest of the stuff that they've got out there. So you're going to have to stop them now or things are going to get really bad. Apple has also attempted to use its monopoly to collect user data and stifle innovation in the automotive industry by, among other things, impeding the development of digital key technologies by requiring them to be offered in Apple's proprietary wallet product and creating new single points of power over emerging use of the iPhone. Finally, Apple's monopolization of smartphone markets gives it tremendous power over the lives of millions of Americans. Privacy, security, and other alleged countervailing factors do not justify Apple's anti-competitive conduct. So remember how this works if you were here with us in Apple versus Epic. So there are per se violations of monopoly antitrust law, which are things like price fixing and engaging in criminal conspiracies and things of that nature, which are obviously illegal regardless of the effects that are caused. In this case, we're, we're looking at things that are ordinarily legal. A, a party is ordinarily allowed to contract around the rights that others might have to its hardware to access the things that it has provided, that it has manufactured. And so we're going to wind up in the land of the rule of reason, which is where you've got these kind of combating forces where the the plaintiff in this case, the Department of Justice, the prosecutorial side, is going to claim that these things are anti-competitive. And then the defendant, Apple, is going to get the chance to say they may be anti-competitive, but they're also pro-competitive in these other ways. They're countervailing factors and the pro-competition reasons exceed the value of the anti-competitive reasons. And so what we looked at early on, which is the vagaries around antitrust law, wind up in this fight over who's more bad than the other and whether or not these things should be allowed because overall they're competitive uh, in, a, in, in a holistic way. Uh, and so what the Department of Justice is doing in this section is saying they're going to come back at you, judge, with privacy, security and some other stuff. That doesn't count or it isn't good enough. There are no valid pro-competitive benefits of Apple's exclusionary conduct that would outweigh its anti-competitive effects. So this is pre-arguing what they know is going to have to be presented by Apple. This is how you would do a document like this. This is good stuff. The Department of Justice has written this fairly well. Apple's moat building has not resulted in lower prices, higher output, improved innovation, or a better user experience for smartphone users. This is going to be where they're going to have real trouble. 
right? Because Apple's going to argue that the walled garden provides a better user experience for any number of reasons. And by not having a walled garden, it would be a worse experience and that users continue to choose the experience that Apple provides. That's what's getting them the market share that they're getting, not anti-competitive conduct. Apple markets itself on the basis of privacy and security to dif differentiate itself from what competition is left in the smartphone market. But this does not justify Apple's monopolistic and anti-competitive conduct. Apple imposes contractual restraints on app creation and distribution, imposes hefty fees on many types of smartphone interactions, and conditionally restricts API access on its smartphone platform simply because it can. There are limited, if any, competitive constraints on this conduct. As a point of comparison, Apple does not engage in such conduct on its Mac laptops and computers. It gives developers the freedoms to distribute software directly to consumers on Mac without going through an Apple-controlled app store and without paying Apple app store fees. This still provides a safe and secure experience for Mac users, demonstrating that Apple's control over app distribution and creation on the iPhone is substantially more restrictive than necessary to protect user privacy and security. And this goes directly to what we saw being fought over in Epic versus Apple. It may or may not be the case uh, that the fact that they allow Mac stuff to go through without the same kind of personal review process as the App Store is going to be a problem for Apple. I think it's a fairly good logical argument from the Department of Justice here. But I don't think that the courts are likely to require identical security procedures across multiple platforms, across multiple technologies. And that's where Epic ran into trouble with respect to Apple's argument on this point in the past. In fact, many alternative technologies that Apple's conduct suppresses would enhance user security and privacy. And we saw all those arguments about digital wallets and super apps, et cetera. Apple is also willing to make the iPhone less secure and less private if that helps maintain its monopoly power. For example, text messages sent from iPhones to Android phones are unencrypted as a result of Apple's conduct. If Apple wanted to, Apple could allow iPhone users to send encrypted messages to Android users while still using iPhone message on their iPhone, which would instantly improve the privacy and security of iPhone and other smartphone users. Similarly, Apple is willing to sacrifice user privacy and security in other ways, so long as doing so benefits Apple. For example, Apple allows the developers to distribute apps through its app store that collect vast amounts of personal and sensitive data about users, including children, at the expense of users' privacy and security. Apple also enters agreements to share in the revenue generated from advertising that relies on harvesting users' personal data. For example, Apple accepts massive payments from Google to set its search engine as the default in the Safari web browser, even though Apple recognizes that other search engines better protect user privacy. And again, this is the, the argument that the, the perfect is the enemy of the good, right? Apple is allowed to make these decisions as to what level of privacy and security it wants to maintain and say that we're more secure and private than the Android or Samsung ecosystems. And it still doesn't have to mean that they chose privacy in every specific instance, uh, as the Department of Justice would accuse them of doing here. Finally, Apple selectively enforces its rules and contractual restrictions for app distribution and app creation. For example, when it benefits Apple to do so, Apple permits developers to introduce mini programs, stream content from the cloud, use virtual currency, and receive special permissions or access APIs not automatically available to everyone. And here, even though it's not pled to completion here, we don't get all of the evidence that we would need to understand this entirely, and you don't need to do that in a document like this. This is the most interesting aspect of the case to me, right? Apple has been accused by reasonable parties of selectively enforcing certain of its rules either to benefit itself or other big companies that it wants to kowtow to, towards. And so this is an area where I think the Department of Justice might have some success, depending on what evidence they have behind the scenes on this particular point. Apple is doing things um, in an arbitrary or capricious way to benefit itself. And the way that they are doing things does not suggest they're competing for the smartphone market. That I can actually see and imagine having a chance to succeed. Some of this other stuff, I don't, I don't think so. Ultimately, Apple chooses to make the iPhone private and secure when doing so benefits Apple, sure. Apple chooses alternative courses when those courses help Apple protect its monopoly power. Make money could be the argument here, right? When Apple makes money. Apple's conduct underscores the protectual nature of any claim that Apple's conduct is justified by protecting the user privacy or security. And I, here, I think this is just wrong, right? The fact that they have said that this is not a major risk of security here and it benefits us in this other way is not uh, an argument to say that every time we say privacy or security is protectual or lying, right? This is the way you say they are liars who lie in legalese. Pretext, pretextual. So, yeah. The smartphone industry. All right, we're finally going to get to it, right? You're going to establish how Apple is a monopolist in the smartphone industry. Mobile phones are portable devices that enable communicators over radio frequencies instead of telephone landlines. These signals are transmitted by equipment covering distinct geographic areas or cells, which is why mobile phones were called cell phones. The first commercial cell phones became available in the 1980s. I still call it my cell phone. Since then, improvements in both cell phone components and wireless technology have made it possible to transfer large volumes of data around the globe in a short period. 
As a result, mobile phones began to offer a wider array of features and the adoption of mobile phones dramatically increased. Today, nearly all American adults own a mobile phone. I don't know how you would actually participate in society without one, so I do agree that that part is essential. Let's make sure we grab some of these other points. David Hollinger, thank you again for the super chat. To Moore's point, we as devs don't enter the iOS Android market, they enter the mobile market. Most of the smaller devs can't afford to not develop for Apple, meaning Apple controls said devs access to the market. I understand why you want to be an Apple uh, provider. I understand why that audience is attractive to a developer. And I understand why it seems unfair that Apple has these rules that they impose on getting access to the App Store, et cetera. But I do think, and again, I'm tilted here as a corporate lawyer that writes contracts in terms of service, that these companies are, are to be allowed in general as a whole the right to control access to their hardware and their software. And to the extent some developers can't make it work with the rules that are imposed upon them by a company like Apple, I think ultimately that's okay. And it's not illegal under the Sherman Act. It doesn't make them an antitrust violator or things like that. It might make them a bad party. It might make them evil. It might make them a company that you want to go on social media and say, these guys suck for whatever reason or another, but it doesn't make them uh, subject to huge fines or uh, being sent to prison or whatever else might happen uh, in a case like this one. So I hear you. I agree that Apple is not always the best business partner on these things. I agree that that can hurt developers. I don't agree that that's necessarily illegal or that developers are just entitled to access the iOS ecosystem because they want to. Shireen, bro, thank you for the super chat. I personally like research, Rick, always thorough. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that too. I just didn't want to not be able to talk about this all with you. And I knew I wouldn't have the time to do a full day's research on a video like this one. So I appreciate you sticking with me on the new approach to, uh, going through a lawsuit like this one. Um, but we'll see if this works for everybody. You can certainly leave your comments to this video when it's done or in the podcast form. I will generally see those. Um, so let me know, but I, I'm glad you're here with me to talk about these things. So thank you. We do have one response from David here before we get back started into the lawsuit here. Let me just see if I can grab this. David says, no, I mean, it's not cost effective to build only for Android, meaning all apps are constrained by Apple's rules in the whole. Devs are too expensive. And that would suggest a kind of monopolistic control over the development sphere, the the access to mobile software making on the whole. I, I don't know whether or not you could prove that point, um, but I do get the notion that Apple has too big of an audience for you to ignore uh, and that it's it can be unfair to have to try to compete with to try to comply with the rules that Apple puts out there, certainly. So I, I get the unfairness and I get how devs can be upset at Apple. That makes total sense to me. It doesn't make as much sense to me that they are a monopolist in the smartphone market or are otherwise able to use that monopoly power in an anti-competitive manner. Okay, smartphones. We get a little bit more from the Department of Justice on how smartphones work. We're going to skip that. I think we understand it. Smartphone hardware, frame and screen. That's how a smartphone operates. You've got Wi-Fi. You've got Bluetooth. You've got that near-field communication or NFC. Three device manufacturers, Apple, Samsung, and Google, account for approximately 94% of all smartphones by revenue in the United States. Apple and Samsung alone account for approximately 90% of all smartphone revenue in the United States. Cloud-based technologies are run using hardware and software in remote computing centers rather than by hardware and software on smartphone. Yep. Smartware, smartphone operating systems, in addition to hardware, smartphones include various software components that make a smartphone more attractive to users. The most important software component is the smartphone's operating system, the foundational software that manages both the hardware and all other software programs on the device. All iPhones are preloaded with Apple's proprietary exclusive iPhone operating system, iOS. The only other significant mobile operating system in the United States is Google's Android, which works with smartphones manufactured by Samsung, whose U.S. headquarters is located in this district. I guess that's our answer to New Jersey, huh? So it seems likely that Samsung is involved in this action in some respect for them to decide to bring this action at Samsung's U.S. headquarters. Uh, rather than where the Department of Justice lives or whether or, or where Apple lives. And you wouldn't really bring a case against Apple where they live. So perhaps Samsung, whose U.S. headquarters is located in this district, is the answer to the question of why New Jersey. Not sure for, for certain, but it might be. 
Software applications known as apps are programs that perform specific tasks at the smartphone user's request, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We know how phones work. Thank you, Department of Justice. This is still important for a legal document, but I think we can skip it in this part of this video. We are, after all, almost at three hours. All smartphones compete against each other in a broad, relevant market. But industry participants, including Apple, assess competition among smartphones in narrower markets that are best understood as submarkets of the larger all smartphone market. This is going to be the performance smartphone market that they were talking about earlier on. Because Apple chooses not to compete to sell new, new smartphones in the entry level tier, the most relevant market to assess its conduct is a narrower submarket that excludes this tier. Regardless of how the market is drawn, however, Apple's conduct is unlawful. Performance smartphones are a relevant product market. Performance smartphones are a narrower relevant product market within the broader smartphone market. This narrower market inc include this, uh, excuse me, includes those smartphones that compete with most iPhones and excludes the lowest end smartphones, which industry participants sometimes refer to as entry level smartphones. Industry participants recognize a distinction between these higher end smartphones and lower end entry level smartphones. Apple's own documents indicate it does not view entry level smartphones as competing with the iPhone and other performance smartphones. Performance smartphones have distinct characteristics and uses as compared to other smartphones. For example, entry-level smartphones are generally made with lower quality materials and are less durable. They have lower performance components such as slower processors and lower capacity storage, which prevent users from running more intensive applications or storing large volumes of pictures and data on the device. Entry-level smartphones often lack features such as the NFC antenna that allows consumers to use their phone to make payments or access passes for public transit. So you can see here, as we saw with respect uh, to the Microsoft Activision uh, antitrust lawsuit that we're seeing a definition try to be put forth here that excludes a portion of the market that you might think is a substitute for an iPhone or a high-end Galaxy phone. And when I was doing the pricing that we looked at earlier, I was trying to equate the highest end phones that I could find to each other, right? So you've got the Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra 512 gigabytes at this 1269 price. You've got the uh, Google Pixel Fold 256 gigabytes obsidian unlocked at 12.99 and then you've got the the iphone here at the iphone 15 plus at starting at 11 11 .99. so i was trying to look at things that were comparable when we talked about this earlier but you can see much like trying to get nintendo out of the market in order to establish monopolist in microsoft or sony depending on your point of view uh that can be something that is argued in court as to whether or not these things should apply it sounds like the department of justice has some board meetings or other background material of Apple itself determining that it doesn't participate in this entry-level smartphones market. I don't really argue that point as much. I think that the, the high-end iPhones compete against the high-end uh, Samsung and Google phones. Consumers typically purchase performance smartphones under different terms than entry-level smartphones. Consumers generally use entry-level smartphones along with prepaid service plans. By contrast, consumers usually purchase performance smartphones for use with postpaid service plans that include promotional discounts to consumers who purchase performance smartphones. Because of these differences, among others, between entry-level smartphones and performance smartphones, entry-level smartphones are not reasonable substitutes for performance smartphones. Moreover, competition from non-performance smartphones is not sufficient today to prevent Apple from exercising monopoly power in the performance smartphone market. Smartphones are a broader relevant product market. Smartphones are a relevant product market. Smartphones are distinct from phones that offer less capable hardware. So this is flipping from switching from flip phones or whatever other phones you might find out there. Smartphones are different. I think we can agree to that. The United States is the relevant geographic market for performance smartphones and smartphones. The United States is a relevant geographic market. Users in the United States demand services offered by U.S. retailers when they purchase a smartphone. For example, consumers who purchase a smartphone from their mobile carrier can get assistance with activating the new device, setting it up and, and transferring important content like apps, messages, photos, and video to their new smartphone. Consumers must also purchase smartphones through a U.S. retailer if they want to take advantage of valuable promotions offered by their mobile carrier. I actually think the, the need to have a mobile carrier is probably a better argument for why the U.S. is more appropriate than the global market for smartphones. Uh, but I'm not sure I'm actually convinced about that. I haven't tried to purchase a smartphone uh, from a global vendor, but I suspect it's not as difficult as the, as the Department of Justice would have you believe on this. Finally, potentially new smartphone entrants to the U.S. market must also comply with telecommunications regulations and satisfy other legal requirements. No extensive regulatory framework governs how Apple operates its platform with respect to developers, but there are a number of regulatory requirements that must be met in order to enter the smartphone market. 
For example, sm some smart phone makers are effectively barred from offering their smartphones to U.S. consumers. And I don't really have an issue with this. It allows them to try to argue a, 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 a narrower market because obviously Apple does not have as much control over the global smartphone market. And so that's what the Department of Justice is trying to argue against. I don't know if that's ultimately a winner for them. If I'm Apple, I'm going to argue that the proper market is the global market. But I think probably uh, the United States market is the more appropriate. Apple has monopoly power in the smartphone and performance smartphone markets. And here we go. It only took us 66 pages to get here, folks. But here's the claim that Apple has monopoly power. Let's see how they establish it. Apple has monopoly power in the smartphone and performance smartphone markets because it has the power to control prices or exclude competition in each of them. Apple also enjoys substantial and durable market shares in these markets. Moreover, Apple's market shares likely underestimate Apple's power because they are protected by significant barriers to entry, network effects, and switching costs. Apple recognizes and exploits these barriers to entry, network effects, and switching costs to protect itself from competition from rival platforms and innovations, products, and services that may diminish consumer reliance on the iPhone. Apple's power will likely increase over time. So this is just the assertion here that we get in the opening paragraph. They have power because they can control prices or exclude competition in each of them. And this is going to be where economists are going to fight over this probably for years in court because Apple's going to argue, as we just saw from the prices of current phones and, and phones in the past, that they don't control prices in the smartphone market and they can't exclude competition. Competition still exists. They can defeat competitors. But as we saw, defeating competitors is not a, a violation of the law. It's what we would expect from competition, right? So when we look at this, competition produces injuries. An enterprising firm may negatively affect rivals' profits or drive them out of business. We would expect that to not be the end of the story when we're talking about Apple and its market share. In the US market for performance smartphones where Apple views itself as competing, Apple estimates its market share exceeds 70%. These estimates likely understate Apple's market share today. For example, Apple's share among key demographics, including younger audiences and higher income households is even larger. Even in the broadest market consisting of all smartphones, including many smartphones that Apple and industry participants do not view as competing with Apple's iPhones and other high-end phones, Apple's share is more than 65% by revenue. And is, is revenue the appropriate tack here to take, especially when you've just established or tried to establish that Apple is making disproportionate revenues for less cost, right? They're, they're selling less than 65 and 70% of the phones out there in the market. So is revenue the appropriate calculation? That's another thing that you might see fought by Apple. Similarly, even if consumers choose one phone over another, the vast majority of developers consider iPhones and Android devices as complements because developers must build apps that run on both platforms due to the lack of user multi-homing having multiple versions of the phones in their home. In effect, the lack of multi-homing among users necessitates multi-homing among developers. That's what we just saw in the Super Chats. This market reality increases the power that Apple is, bit, is able to exercise over developers that seek to reach users on smartphones, especially performance smartphones that run sophisticated apps. Apple's high market shares are durable. Over the last decade, Apple increased its share of smartphones sold in the United States most years. Through the same period, Apple collected more than half the revenue for all smartphones sold in the United States. So the one thing I note here is you'll see the numbers here get a little weird. They get a little squishy, right? Apple increases share of smartphones sold, but you're not telling us the number, numbers that you know in order to make this sentence possible. And then you start talking about more than half of the revenue in the United States. So I'm, I'm watching this closely and saying there's sleight of hand here uh, when we see this being said in this way. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not seeing a proof of monopoly power in this market as of yet. Apple's Apple's monopoly power in the relevant markets is protected by substantial barriers to entry and expansion. I think the Department of Justice did a good job of establishing that there is a moat, there is stickiness. Apple encourages that moat and that stickiness, not specifically illegal in running a company, uh, but I, I don't think they have a difficulty showing this. For example, since fewer than 10% of smartphone purchasers in the United States are buying their first smartphone, there are fewer new customers available for Apple's rivals, and indeed for Apple itself. Instead, rivals must encourage existing iPhone users to switch from using an iPhone to using another smartphone when they replace or upgrade their phone. As a result, switching costs, many created or exacerbated by Apple, impose substantial barriers to entry and expansion for rival smartphones. This barrier is increasingly impenetrable. Nearly 90% of iPhone owners in the United States replace their iPhone with another iPhone. At least one U.S. carrier estimates that at least that as high as 98% of iPhone users on its network replace or upgrade their iPhone in a given quarter by buying another iPhone. Now, if you're going to establish some of this stuff, I'm, I'm interested in why you didn't actually have a section talking about the way iPhone trade-ins and iPhone subscriptions and working with carriers is incentivized in the United States to stay in that iPhone ecosystem within the smartphone market, not the app development market. This is another reason why the way this lawsuit is written suggests to me that it was probably going a different direction 
maybe even before the Epic case came out the way that it did. Uh, and they've, they've tacked away from app developer monopolies and app store monopolies towards this smartphone approach because they thought they could attach things like the smartwatch and the car stuff that we read about earlier to smartphone power overall. So they say they have barriers to entry or more precisely stickiness in leaving the Apple ecosystem. Some of the stuff we saw referenced above is actually Apple providing services to customers and customers not being able to receive those same services on alternate phones, which isn't exactly what we're concerned about in antitrust law, but we'll see. Apple's iPhone platform is protected by several additional barriers to entry and expansion, including strong network and scale effects and high switching costs and frictions. For example, if an iPhone user wants to buy an Android smartphone, they're likely to face significant financial, technological, and behavioral obstacles to switching. The user may need to relearn how to operate their smartphone using a new interface, transfer large amounts of data, purchase new apps, or transfer or buy new subscriptions and accessories. Yes, this is the nature of hardware in the 21st century. These switching costs and frictions are even higher when software applications, APIs, and other functionality do not help the different devices and operating systems communicate. Many prominent, well-financed companies have tried and failed to successfully enter the relevant markets because of these entry barriers. Past failures include Amazon, which released its Fire mobile phone in 2014 but could not profitably sustain its business, Microsoft, which discontinued its mobile business in 2017, HTC, which exited the market by selling its smartphone business to Google in September 2017, and LG, which exited the smartphone market in 2021. Today, only Samsung and Google remain as meaningful competitors in the U.S. performance smartphone market. Barriers are so high that Google is a distant third to Apple and Samsung, despite the fact that Google controls development of the Android operating system and doesn't try to maintain the same kind of hardware position that Apple does. Apple's monopoly power is separately demonstrated by direct indicia. That's uh, lawyer talk for facts. For example, Apple can and does profitably forego innovation without fear of losing customers to competitors. So here we see that kind of shadow approach that we talked about earlier, right? Their theory is... If Apple is doing this, they must be a monopolist because they can survive in this market uh, without providing the maximum powered iPhone that they possibly could, regardless of R&D costs or what have you. And like so many other aspects of this particular legal document, my reaction to that is that the Department of Justice is advocating that only perfect privacy, only perfect security, only maximum research and development is indicative of a competitive marketplace. And that just isn't the case, right? Apple doesn't have to spend every ounce of its profitability on increasing the competitiveness of the iPhone to show that they aren't a monopolist in the smartphone industry. There isn't a business in any industry that isn't carefully evaluating whether or not to spend research and development dollars and whether or not to innovate in its hardware, uh, regardless of its market position. And so I, I have a problem with that theory overall. I suspect Apple will have a problem with that theory when we see their return volley. Um, but that's what we see here is this kind of shadow, shadow monopolist. It's like, if Apple's doing this and we've established it, we've asserted it and we've established that they're doing this. We've also asserted that they could make more money not doing it. So we're imposing our business judgment on theirs. Uh, and because they're not doing it, we can say that they're a monopolist because a non-monopolist would have to do it in order to compete. Uh, and we come back to that quote about we're doing good enough for the consumer. Apple's profits and profit margins for nearly every aspect of the iPhone are further evidence of Apple's monopoly power. So they're making a lot of money. We already know that monopoly profits are not indicative of antitrust law breaking. Uh, for example, Apple's per unit smartphone profit margins are far more than its next most profitable rival. Apple charges carriers considerably more than its rivals to buy and resell its smartphones to the public and employs contract clauses that may impede the ability of carriers to promote rival smartphones, a harmful exercise of monopoly power that is hidden to most consumers. Uh, this is what I was just talking about with respect to how we interact with carriers here in the United States. Um, and it might be a harmful exercise of monopoly power if they have monopoly power, but it, you can't just assert that it's a harmful exercise of monopoly power, proving that they have monopoly power. That, that, that doesn't work that way. It's kind of bootstrapping the argument. Apple extracts fees from developers as much as 30% when users purchase apps or making app payments. Apple also extracts that 0.15% commission from banks on credit card transactions through its wallet, while none of its smartphone competitors with digital wallets charge any fee. Note that they don't reference competitors with app stores charging the same 30% that Apple does. Apple predicts that it will collect nearly $1 billion in worldwide revenue on Apple Pay fees by 2025. A recent report by the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau suggests these revenues will only increase as analysts expect the value of digital wallet tap-to-pay transactions will grow by over 150% by 2028. 
And again, if you're not reading this in a lawsuit from the Department of Justice asserting antitrust problems, you would look at this analyzing Apple and say it looks like they found a market that needed servicing, that banks could get more transactions and more of what they were looking for through an aspect of the hardware like this one, that tap to pay functionality, and that Apple by servicing that need is making a billion dollars or $1.5 billion by 2028. But in this context, you're suggesting that it's all a, a, a way of controlling uh, the smartphone market and you're doing this for nefarious reasons in order to maintain your high profit rates. Apple increasingly charges developers additional fees to promote their apps in the App Store as well. In fact, this is one of the fastest growing parts of Apple's services business with revenue increasing by more than a third to $4.4 billion in 2022. These indicia of Apple's monopoly power are direct evidence of its monopoly power in the relevant markets. The stuff we just talked about is direct evidence of monopoly power within the cell phone um, or, or smartphone market. Uh, I'm interested in what you think in the comments here to that particular assertion, because that is apparently all we're going to get on that point in this lawsuit. And I find myself not, not going along with that assertion so terribly well. Uh, paragraph 190, the stuff we just talked about is evidence of monopoly power. Uh, what do you all think of, th of that in the chat? Because I'm just not so sure myself. Leave a comment before we head on to, we're not going to cover jurisdiction and venue. We're going to go straight to the complaints, I think, here. Violations alleged. Um, and, and then we will continue with this video, finish it up, and hopefully be under four hours because I've got some basketball to watch. I really do. <laughs> all right, nobody has any comments, which means they're all fine with this assertion, I think. That's, that's what I would say about my chat. They're all fine with this. Or they all hate it and they just don't want to share it with me. That's totally fine for folks that are just listening. Uh, but um, let me talk about what they've actually alleged as part of this lawsuit now in page 71. First claim for relief is monopolization of the performance smartphone market in violation of Sherman Act Section 2. So we incorporate everything we just said that we've been reading for a couple hours. Apple has willfully monopolized the performance smartphone market in the United States through an exclusionary course of conduct and the anti-competitive acts described herein. Each of Apple's actions individually and collectively increased, maintained, or protected its performance smartphone monopoly. Apple's anti-competitive acts include, but are not limited to, its contractual restrictions against app creation, distribution, and access to APIs that have impeded apps and technologies, including but not limited to super apps, cloud streaming, messaging wearables, and digital wallets. The areas identified in this complaint reflect a non-exhaustive list of recent anti-competitive acts, but as technology advances, both the technologies impeded and the specific manner of impediment may shift in response to technological and regulatory change consistent with Apple's past conduct. While each of Apple's acts is anti-competitive in its own right, Apple's interrelated and interdependent actions have had a cumulative and self-reinforcing effect that has harmed competition and the comp competitive process. Apple's anti-competitive acts have had harmful effects on competition and consumers. Apple's exclusionary conduct lacks a pro-competitive justification that offsets the harm created by caused by Apple's anti-competitive and unlawful conduct. So again, that's what all those rest of those pages were for. They're monopolists. They're doing bad things. And those bad things hurt people. And so you should find them in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Similarly, they have attempted monopolization. Now, this is what we would call uh, a charge in the alternative. You see it referenced here in the heading. So if you don't think they're monopolists right now, they've tried to monopolize. Apple has attempted to monopolize the performance smartphone market in the United States through an exclusionary course of conduct and the anti-competitive acts described herein. And usually you'd see these kinds of things be price fixing or access at the smartphone level to things like components or, or things of that nature when we're talking about a hardware market. Uh, but they've tried to attach this notion of exclusionary conduct, enhancing market power uh, by excluding aspects of markets that are only related to the market at issue here. So it's an interesting case. I'm not sure it's going to work out for them, but it's not something that, that Apple's going to have success easily dismissing. Each of Apple's actions individually and collectively increased Apple's market power in the performance smartphone market. Uh, same kind of claim. Uh, they've acted with specific intent to monopolize, to destroy effective competition in the performance smartphone market in the United States. There's dangerous probability that unless restrained, Apple will succeed in monopolizing that market in violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Act. So you see it's in the alternative, right? If you don't think they're monopolists yet, this stuff should still go to proving that they are attempting to monopolize. And the problem that you have there is if they don't have monopoly power right now, uh, it's very difficult to piece out uh, the the what what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do in order to improve their market share. 
Uh, and so they've tried to establish that here. This is a much weaker kind of claim than they're already a monopolist in this context. So we'll skip ahead. Third claim, monopolization of the smartphone market. So the first one was performance smartphones. And then they try the third claim, which is, okay, if it's not performance smartphones, then maybe it's the whole smartphone market, right? Because they have a lower percentage of the smartphone market. We know that, but we know they're still doing these bad things. And we think they still have enough power in that market, according to what we've alleged in our document. And the fourth claim is monopolization in violation of Sherman Act uh, uh, of the smartphone market. So they're both alternative claims, right? So we've got performance market monopolization, attempted performance market uh, monopolization, whole smartphone market monopolization, attempted whole smartphone market monopolization. And then we've got violation of the New Jersey Antitrust Act, because we're in New Jersey. So we might as well ask for the New Jersey violation. And then we've got a strange one, violations of Wisconsin state law. The plaintiff state of Wisconsin repeats and realleges everything above. And the aforementioned practices by Apple violate Wisconsin's Antitrust Act. These violations substantially affect the people of Wisconsin and have impacts within the state of Wisconsin. Nobody else in the state list asks for separate antitrust uh, discussion of their own laws. So it's just Wisconsin and New Jersey, in addition to the ones we just saw, to remedy these illegal acts. Uh, a judge and decree that they've unlawfully monopolized or attempted to monopolize under the Sherman Act. A judge and decree violation of the other stuff we've asked for. Enter relief as needed. Give us money that we need. Enjoin Apple from continuing to do all these very bad things. Prevent Apple from using its control of app distribution to undermine cross-platform technologies. Prevent Apple from using private APIs to undermine, undermine cross-platform technologies like messaging, smartwatches, and digital wallets. Prevent Apple from using the terms and conditions of its contracts with developers, accessory makers, and others to obtain, maintain, extend, or entrench a monopoly. Now, this is a difficult one because their terms on their own don't do any of these things with respect to a monopoly. So this requires some kind of change that would have to be agreed to by the parties and the judge to how Apple uses its contract terms because Apple, even if they lose this case, is not gonna go without contract rights as to how you access the iOS or the app store. So that's an interesting one. Um, and then they also ask for anything else you think we need, right? If you think there's more penalties that we're entitled to, if you think there's more costs that we're entitled to, anything else that the court thinks we need, give it to us there. And then you've got pages and pages of signatures from attorneys general that want to be a part of this. Find your attorney general here. Uh, and so that's the whole 88 page document, folks. So I, I hope that that was helpful informationally. We've got a few more things to cover before we end today's video. I did want to mention that Apple has responded to this antitrust lawsuit. Their spokesperson, Fred Saints, said at Apple, we innovate every day to make technology people love. Designing products that work seamlessly together, protect people's privacy and security, and create a magical experience for our users. They sound like Disney. This lawsuit threatens who we are and the principles that set Apple products apart in fiercely competitive markets. If successful, it would hinder our ability to create the kind of technology people expect from Apple, where hardware, software, and services intersect. It would also set a dangerous precedent, empowering government to take a heavy hand in designing people's technology. We believe this lawsuit is wrong on the facts and the law, and we will vigorously defend against it. And honestly, I don't think Apple had another choice here except to vigorously defend because I do think the government is taking a heavier hand than usual on establishing what business models should and shouldn't be allowed. In this case, I think that you can shorthand read this lawsuit as guard, walled gardens should not be allowed under the law. And to the extent that's true, Apple's affected, of course, the video game console manufacturers are affected, of course. And I own, honestly don't think that's a winner long term because I think even if the Department of Justice has no longer following their review and report on how to enforce Section 2 under the Sherman Act, this was based on the legal precedents that the Supreme Court and other courts had put forth and is still the law of the land. And I think they're going to have difficulty proving things like the way Apple operates is actually a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. I'm not sure that they can show monopoly power within the smartphone market. I'm not sure that they can show anti-competitive conduct as affecting the smartphone market as opposed to the developer market or some of the other things that we saw discussed in places like the House report that we discussed at the top of this video. So I think this is a very tough case uh, for the Department of Justice to ultimately win, but I would never tell you here, viewers, that a Department of Justice case is one that you can just hand wave away and say that's laughable or it's going to get kicked out immediately. So I think this is a case that Apple's going to have to live with for a while. It's going to cost a lot of legal money. And I'm going to jump in and talk about it here in virtual legality uh, when I can, when there's things that I think are significant enough. If you see something that you want to have covered, put it in the comments, give me a DM, send me an email, whatever else it might be. 
uh, because I don't know if I'm going to be able to cover it as specifically. In fact, I know I'm not as the Epic versus Apple case. And this is likely to go very, very long and have lots of documents indeed. So that all being said, let's finish this up. I want to make sure I grab those super chats and other comments that people have made. If you want to support commentary and conversations like this, please do check us out on Player or Patreon. We've got links in the description of this video. Uh, and otherwise, just commenting, upvoting, leave a like, subscribe to all that good stuff for YouTube. All of that stuff helps, as well as these super chats that I've been trying to grab as we go along. Sith Randall, thank you so much for the 999 pound super chat. Epic Game Store on the Mac used more power than the games I ran. I do not want a power hog on my phone. I choose Apple for a reason. Homogenous is not competition. Allow the choice of a walled garden or not. And I tend to agree with this, right? My tilt editorializing is towards this. You've heard it a couple times during this video, but I think that ultimately Apple and walled gardens in general present a different business model than a wide open ecosystem and developers don't like it. They don't have to like it, but consumers sometimes do. And there are a lot of people that have shown their support for a walled garden ecosystem by their purchase and investment in that Apple iPhone iOS ecosystem. And you can think that's stickiness from 2007, but honestly, 2007 isn't that long ago for a a business to have the success that it has had with a with a product like the iPhone. So I do think Apple has shown there was a market here that they have served. And I think that this lawsuit from the Department of Justice does read to me as a department that really hates how big and successful Apple is, more than establishing that they have substantial market power in smartphones overall, or that they use the various techniques in their contracts and otherwise to affect the smartphone market, as opposed to other markets where I think the Department of Justice might have had more success, but clearly they wanted a more expansive ruling. They wanted a more expansive uh, argument here. And so they went for the smartphone market. When I read it, as I said at the top of this video, I thought that must not be the case because no one would actually argue that Apple has a monopoly in smartphones, but indeed that is exactly what the Department of Justice has argued here this past few days. So if anybody else has any other questions, please leave a question with a Q or an at Hogue law. And we see one right here. Super Chats, obviously, I've been covering, but it's not limited to Super Chats, folks. I always appreciate the support, but it's not mandatory. Uh, let me get to RJH00 here. Hogue, it seems to me like the whole argument boils down to the DOJ saying that it should be illegal for iPhone to be worse because it's missing features or it doesn't allow apps to work on it as well. It can sound like that, but they're using it as a proxy, right? They are saying that Apple degrading its own phone in these specific ways, and they list off all those things that we read for the middle portion of this video, is indicative of their having monopoly power because if they were really competing, they wouldn't be able to do these things. They'd go and get this extra money. But I do think that skips the step of companies doing all sorts of things for reasons to hold market share that aren't anti-competitive. They're just ways that they match consumers where they live in object ways that the Department of Justice or the US government on the whole can't see, right? We have these corporations making these decisions and business judgment for a reason. We don't have the courts substituting their own judgment in lieu of these things for a reason, we don't want companies to run a follow the law. Mostly these big companies don't want to get in an antitrust lawsuit that's going to cost them a fortune in legal fees. Uh, and so I don't think the DOJ is quite saying it's illegal for the iPhone to be worse, although they're certainly claiming some of those things are anti-competitive in their nature. They're saying that the fact that the iPhone is worse and can still command a comparable price is indicative of monopoly power. And I think that that's kind of a shadow argument that isn't going to hold up for the length of the, the trial, but I don't think it has to. I think they're trying to get this past the point of the early kind of motion stage and get to an area where they've got more discovery and they can establish these things more mathematically. That would be my guess. Um, but certainly as it stands right now, those folks that are online and saying this is an extraordinarily strong case or something along those lines, I don't see. I certainly see when the Department of Justice acts, you have to take it seriously. I think Apple is taking it seriously, but I don't see this as a strong case, primarily because there's a lot of novelties here and it doesn't match up with jurisprudence in the antitrust sector. So we'll see. Hey, Hettinger, worse is subjective. I can't see that as holding up. Well, you see them do that a lot of times in the lawsuit, right? We tried to read through as much as we could during the course of this video. And you see a lot of times they say, uh, consumers would be better off if this wasn't happening, or this would improve the profits of Apple if they weren't doing this. And a lot of those are essentially pie in the sky, speculative predictions. And so some of that is allowed. You have to look to the future a little bit on, on some of these things. Uh, but some of it I thought went a little bit too far. You're gonna have to make a better case than that to get across the finish line if you're the Department of Justice. But on its face, I can't just hand wave and throw this lawsuit out. 
Uh, it doesn't have some of the ridiculousness that we saw in the Epic case. Uh, and so Apple's going to have to take it seriously, no question. Nishay Jones says, Hogue, but is the iPhone worse, though? It's just different than Android. Uh, it, it is worse to some factors, right? Like developers would prefer to have it be more open. They'd prefer to get their own app stores in there. We've seen that from Tim Sweeney and Epic. Uh, and we see the Department of Justice kind of borrow that argument from developers and other ecosystem participants other than phone buyers and users that say this is not as good as it could have been and Apple could have made more money if they opened it up. And Apple is going to say privacy and security. I would also say if I were in Apple's shoes, essentially convenience and efficiency that folks are attracted to an ecosystem that is controlled from top to bottom because they don't have to think about the, the dark web and everything else and figuring out what apps work because at least they have some notion that these have been vetted for operability with their phone and that they don't have to worry about just wasting money on things that don't work at all, right? That's the, the, the PC versus console gamer <clears throat> nature of the thing, right? You have PC gamers say all the time, I can get a higher frame rate. I'm playing Dragon's Dogma 2. I get better value out of Steam. I've built my own computer. I've got all my graphics cards the way I want. And there is certainly value to that. You can get more power uh, and get more efficacy out of your games using that. But I tend to prefer the console experience because I buy a box and the games are all supposed to work on that box. And that's that's what I want out of my experience. And people say, well, that's not the most efficient way to spend your money or to play your video games. And I say, that's fine. I like to not have to worry about making sure the box works, making sure nothing lights on fire, making sure everything works with each other. And I think that's the same kind of Android versus iPhone approach. I'm a console gamer at heart, right? Turquoise Tide says, I know that initial filings can be light on details and heavier on PR for the court of public opinion, but this one seems exceptionally light on the substance in lieu of faulty premises and assertions. When I scanned this yesterday, I kept waiting for them to dive into how Apple had this power over this market. And I think they just hand wave it because I don't think there's a great argument for it. They, they, they say at the end, basically, that all the stuff we said before is proof that they are monopolists. And I think that's kind of... Uh, bootstrapping the argument entirely, saying everything bad that they've ever done is proof that they're monopolists. We're saying anything that any company does that is not maximizing to our to our approval at the Department of Justice or whatever regulator we were talking about is evidence of monopoly behavior. And I just don't think that's the case. So I think they're gonna have a problem with that, but I don't I don't think this is the end of the story because we're gonna have a lot more documents on this at the end of the day. Zelda Master says, let's go shut this puppy down and go watch some basketball, LOL. Yes, I am more than ready to watch some March Madness basketball. This is the first Friday of the tournament. This is one of my favorite days of the year, folks. If you don't know what we're talking about, it is the NCAA tournament in the United States. This is where the colleges all play each other. There's 64 teams, one winner, single elimination. This is the best time of year if it's not snowing out my window when we get done with this video. All right, folks. So I think that's all the comments we have today. If anybody has anything else, Leave a comment to this video. I will generally see those from time to time. Leave a comment to the podcast if you see it on uh, Spotify or Apple, uh, iTunes and whatnot. Uh, and you can you can leave comments there or leave reviews there. All those are helpful. And to everyone that voted in the American Stroke Association Awards, I really appreciate that. They will be revealing who the winner of that vote was on May 1st. And I thank everybody who participated. So thank you so much, everyone. And I will catch you on the next episode of Virtual Legality or Hangouts and Headlines. And I'm going to go catch my breath and watch some basketball. So thanks, everybody. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.